Um, this is a shout out to all the haters who are watching online. We'll, we'll watch a video um, regarding your high haters, regarding um, how we don't talk against Esau. So tonight's Esau's night. I promised y'all that months ago. When I said I was going to do it, and I'm going to do it tonight. It's going to be fun. Going to enjoy it. So verse 5, Deacon? So rock for 51, verse 1, 2, and 5. This is a scripture that goes dedicated to the Israelites that claim that we are in opposition against teaching against our enemy. Esau, who's a so-called white man, that's far from the truth. But the scripture gives us um, exhortation. Read this. Sirach, chapter 51, and verse 1. I will thank thee, O Lord and King, and praise thee, O God, my Savior. I do give praise unto thy name. Verse 2. For thou art my defender and helper, and hast preserved my body from destruction, uh -huh. and from the snare of the slanderous tongue. The most I will preserve our body, our congregation, from destruction and from the snare of the slanderous tongue that you're seeing all over YouTube. When all else fails and all views are failing and you become irrelevant, what do you do? You put out your IC in the title of your videos. That's what you do, which is sad. It's really sad. But the most I says he's going to be our helper and defender. Read on. And from the lips that forge lies. And the lips that forge lies. Make things up. Go ahead. And has been mine helper against mine adversaries. We've been slandered by numerous camps, one in particular for many, many years. And all we've done is grow and, and exponentially. We've spread out. Our congregations have grown even more than ever before. We're doing bigger things, traveling further places. So this the hate is blessings. Y'all understand this. The more hate we get, the more blessings we get. The best thing really to do is stay silent when you hate us and take notes like you've been doing. That's what y'all really doing, taking notes, you know, watching our classes, hating, I hate them niggas. Yeah, what's good to that again? That's good, that's a good one, yeah, that's a good one. The hypocrisy with Israel is endless. Verse 5. From the depth of the belly of hell. Of corrupt, go ahead. From an unclean tongue and from lying words. From an unclean tongue and from lying words. So when you speak slander, you are the belly of hell. That's what you are, the Bible calls you. You are the belly of hell. The belly of evil and death. That's what it is. You're bringing death to yourself doing that. All right? So now, today's topic, which we're afraid to bring out according, according to some, is called Edom. The rise and fall of an imposter. That's today's topic. Edom, the rise and fall of an imposter. Because, again, the alt-right Christian apologetics say that we're not the Jews, but all can be saved. So I mean, if all can be saved, why would it matter if, we're not a, if we are not Jews? Jews, Gentiles, right? Why would it matter? Because they know it does matter. That's why they argue about it. And if there's 25, verse 20, they're going to get the beginning of Esau, this so-called white man, who is not Saudi Arabian. Lord, that's the most dumbest doctrine I've ever heard in my life. East Saudi Arabian. Woo! Ric Flair moments. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Verse 20. Genesis chapter 25 and verse 20. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padanadim, mm -hmm. the sister to Laban, the Syrian. Go ahead. Isaac was 40 years old when he got his wife, Rebekah. Go ahead. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. But she couldn't have any children. And the Lord was entreated of him. The Lord heard his prayer. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. She finally got pregnant. Go ahead. And the children struggled together within her. Stop. These children from the womb were never, ever going to get along. They fought in the womb. Imagine a woman's carrying a twins, and she has pain all in her the whole time. Because the children are literally fighting in her womb. Because one with this, my, my babies, their eyes are closed, it's dark in there, and they're punching and kicking each other back and forth. That's the spiritual thing. We were never, ever meant to like each other or get along. Ever. From the time of our conception until now. Go ahead. And the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? If this pregnancy is to the Lord, why am I in such agony? Why am I in such pain? Go ahead. And she went to inquire of the Lord. And she asked the Lord. Go ahead. And the Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb. Two nations or nationalities are in your womb. Go ahead. And two manner of people. Shall and two manner means they're two separate in terms of how they look. And in terms of their behavior, because everyone in this room knows how white people act and how well, black, well, so-called white people act and how so-called black people act. We act very, very different, except for the coon. They try to act like Esau, but even that looks corny and ridiculous. 
But you can, you can, exactly. But you can tell there's a big difference in terms of humor between us, from um, activities between us. We're different in many spectrums. We're different. Go ahead. And two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. Thank you. Separated means we will always stay to ourselves. Separated. Except for the coons, of course. But we were made, we were made separate. The most side in the womb together, the most side, even though you guys are in the womb together, y'all gonna be separate. You're not gonna be together. Go ahead. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people. Go ahead. And the elder shall serve the younger. The one that is stronger will be the youngest. And the one that would serve one will be the oldest. He would serve the younger who was stronger than him. Israel, well, our nation is the strong. That's why Esau takes our body parts and uses them for all kinds of experiments, the placenta, the, 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 um, the organs, our hearts. Oh, they know we're stronger. In sports, we're better. In music, we're better in everything. We excel in everything that they do. Everything. If they had a heated hockey rink, we take that over too. Golf, well, we took that over. We took that over. We took that. Volleyball, we took that. Baseball, we took that. Basketball, we took that. We took everything from them. They have nothing. We're stronger than them physically and mentally. Because like you wrote out in your class before, how when we go through tribulations, we survive. When they go through things, they kill themselves. They kill themselves, go into depression, need a psychiatrist. We just do it. We get some liquor. Get uh, some 40. Yo, man, I lost my job. You're not going to have a job. Esau's like, blah. Well, they don't even waste no time. <laughs> Two manner of people. We, for example, our kids misbehave. We whip their behind. What's Esau do? Time out, Timmy. Time out. Now he's eating pipe. Now he's eating people and he's gay. He's one or the other. And, and, and we ain't just. Or a serial killer. Right. And we ain't just physically stronger than him either. We're mentally stronger than them. We've just been put to sleep. Right. When you think about the major inventions that this that was made yep. during the time of slavery, we made we did that in the time of virulent hatred, yep. in a time of lynchings, in a time of absolute hate and 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 miseducation and everything else. Despite every effort that could be used to destroy us, we still came up with the great inventions that this world still uses to this day. Y'all just need to check out some of those records. Mm -hmm like black inventors of America, and look at all of those records and uh, records of what we've done, okay, in the face of violence, in the face of hatred. So intellectually speaking, we are superior to them yep. as well. You've just been fooled into thinking that you're not superior, but you are. God says you're superior, not only physically. Right, you work in, you work in the hot sun in the field, in the cotton field, 20 hours a day, you're thinking about inventions. You understand your mind is that you getting whipped in your back, Hurting your fingers, and at the same time, I can make a cotton. I'm make some. What can I make to make this easier? Okay, I'll make that. Esau said, "Okay, yeah, you get, I'll give you your freedom. Give me the patents to that. I'll give you your freedom." And then Esau goes, "I made it." That's what they do. Two manner of people. Go ahead. Verse twenty four. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold. There were twins in her womb. Go ahead. And the first came out red. First came out red. Skin is red. His skin was red. Go ahead. All over, like in hairy garment. And all over, he was hairy. He was like he was hairy. He was hairy. Go ahead. And they called his name Esau. Right. Go ahead. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel. We're gonna deal with that later on in the class. His hand took hold of Esau's heel. That was symbolic to something leading to something else. Go ahead. And his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was three score years old when she bare them. Isaac waited 20 years to finally have his twin boys. He was 40 years old when he got his wife. He had to wait 20 years from the time she had him. He was 60 years old. All right? Let's get to Genesis 27. Let's get his blessing now. Genesis 27, and we're going to read verse 38 to 40 regarding Esau's blessing. Genesis chapter 27 and verse 37. And Isaac answered and said, Verse 38, and Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Because Esau sold his birthright. He didn't care about it. He didn't want it. So he sold it away. And Jacob got it. So he said, okay, without the birthright, I don't want that. Give me that food instead. So then, at the same time, Rebecca sets it up where Jacob gets the blessing as well. The birthright as well as the blessing. So Esau's complaining. He got the birthright from me, and he gets the blessing too. He's crying. So let's see what Isaac says to him. And Isaac, his father, answered and said unto him, Behold, 
Thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth. You got the best parts of the earth. And of the dew of heaven from above. Or wherever you're at, you're at the best. Wherever you're at. Go ahead. And How by, do you get it? Go ahead. And by thy sword shalt thou live. He'll obtain the fatness of the earth and be of the dew of heaven by the edge of the sword. He will be a war monger. He would fight. He would pillage and conquer and destroy to gain what he would get. To get his blessings. His blessing is the art of war. Go ahead. And shalt serve thy brother. That happened under David. Go ahead. And it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. Under David's son, um, David, David's sons went off. Esau went rogue and did their own thing, set their own king. All right? Where we at? Right, in 2 Kings 8 and 20. Uh, read on. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing Wherewith his father blessed him. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing. Go ahead. And Esau said in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. So my, our father's going to die soon. And when he dies, I'm going to kill Jacob for that. So he hated Jacob. He hated him. Go ahead. And these words of Esau, her eldest son, were told to Rebekah. Now these words of Esau, her eldest son, were told to Rebekah. Now, mind you, it says in his heart. He, wasn't, he didn't say that lie, he said it in his mind. So the Lord told Rebekah what Esau was thinking to do to Jacob. The Lord was doing Rebekah on a spiritual level. Remember, he told her what happened to the kids? Because I think loved Esau more. The Lord said, no, I'm not dealing with him. I'm dealing with, with Jacob. So he said, you love Jacob more? I'm going to deal with you regarding that situation. He's going to try to kill the favorite, Jacob. Go ahead. The Lord's favorite. Go ahead. And she sent and called Jacob, her youngest son, and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau, as touching thee, doth comfort himself, pur pur pursing, proposing. proposing to kill thee. Go ahead. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice and arise. Flee thou to Laban, my brother to Haran. Your uncle, go ahead. And tarry with him a few days until thy brother's fury turn away. So he calms down. Go ahead. Until thy brother's anger turn away from thee, and he forget that which thou hast done to him. Then I will send and fetch thee from thence. Why should I be deprived also of you both in one day? Because she, because the most I made it clear to her, if he kills Jacob, I'm gonna kill him. So why I lose both of y'all? So you just you just leave until until Esau calms down. And later on in Genesis, Esau does calm down, but that hatred passed on through his children. It never left his kids. Esau let it ride, but the most but the spirit of hatred never left his descendants. All right? That hatred is still in them even till now. That's why the issue with us being called being Jews is a problem. When we say we're Jews, it pisses them off. Because that hatred is still there even till now. All right? Hebrews 12. Right? I'm going to get that. Hebrews uh, 12 and 16. Because Esau sold his birthright. Then he got mad and, and made it seem as if Jacob stole his birthright when he gave it away. They say he despises it, so he's a liar. He despises his birthright, and then he says, oh, dad, Jacob stole my birthright. No, he didn't. He gave it away for the, for the lentils and the meat and so forth. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person, at, person. Go ahead. as Esau. So Esau is profane. And it says that he was for fornicator. Go ahead. Profane means wicked. Go ahead. Who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Go ahead. For he know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing. Just read that. He was rejected. He was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. So there's no repentance to Esau whatsoever. None. The blessing, none of that is open to him whatsoever. Blessings of God, repentance. Of what he did, on of, of, of the birthright being sold away, he can't get that back. All right? Now, let's get Genesis 36 and 1 regarding his people. Genesis 36 and 1. Genesis chapter 36 and verse 1. Now, these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. So Esau... His name was changed to Edom. Edom means red because he came out red all over like a hairy garment. So the Most High eventually changed his name to Edom. All right? Meaning red. Now let's get Obadiah 1. 
So the Edomites are his children. Now go to verse, jump to verse uh, 9. Verse 9, Genesis 36 and 9. And these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in Mount Seir. The father of the Edomites located where? In Mount Seir. Keep that in mind. The father of the Edomites in Mount Seir. Remember that. Obadiah 1. Our favorite book that no one could seem to answer when we bring it out. <coughs> Obadiah. One, we're going to read all the way to 14. The book of Obadiah, verse 1. The vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Lord God, concerning Edom. We have heard a rumor from the Lord. And an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Okay. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. There will come a time where a nation will say, let's rise up against her in battle. Go ahead, in the last, in the last days. Go ahead. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. Small means greatly hated. Looked down upon, frowned upon, despised. This nation was going to be despised by many nations. Go ahead. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Yeah. Thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock. So Edom's children, or Esau's children, are going to be a prideful nation. Prideful. Arrogant. All right? And it says they were going to dwell in the clefts of the rock. Meaning they will be cave dwellers. That's what they were going to be. Cave dwellers. They dwelt in Mount Seir. Remember that? Mount Seir. Go ahead. Whose habitation is high. And they were going to dwell high in those mountains. Like they do, they dwell high today. But they call skyscrapers today. They, they, they used to living in high altitudes. Go ahead. That saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? To say that means you have to acquire power. And, and rule. That's why it says in verse 1, let us rise up against her in battle. Nations are going to get tired of her and try to overthrow her. Go ahead. Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle. One of the symbols of Edom, the first attribute is red people, one. Edom means red people. Secondly, they were going to live in caves, prideful, and live in the cliffs of the rock, and they exalt themselves as the eagle. So that's, you now it narrows it down pretty much. You narrow it down, you got people who are red in complexion. You used to call them, back in the South, we called them rednecks. Or we call them pecklewoods. Now, a pecklewood is a bird with red feathers, red mm -hmm. on it. So we call them that, or peckle, or um, rednecks, because they're red. Pale face, red, whatever, pink, different shades of red, the same thing. So they're red nation people, prideful, despised by nations, dwell in, dwell in caves, and they exalt themselves as the eagle. One nation through history has exalted themselves as the eagle. Let's go through it real quick. You had, did the Greeks do that? Yeah. The Romans? Yeah. Spanish? Yeah. Russia? Yeah. Hmm. Britain? Yeah. yeah. America? Yeah. Interesting, huh? Interesting, interesting. Look on a mail truck. Okay. Yeah, a mail That's truck, the, yeah. Look at the back they, of your quarter. Look at your quarter. The back of the quarter. Okay, look at their flags when they have on the edge of their flags at the top of the pole. You see they have an eagle on it. When you go through their courts and their different systems around this country, everywhere you go, you see an eagle up there. And they got and they got some place where the eagle is out there pronounced. Yep. Like hey. it's they they know that's their bird. Their Rome have it. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Right, and listen, it's not a coincidence they use that symbol. No. Because the eagle, when you look at the characteristic of an eagle, an eagle is a bird of prey. You understand the uh, eagle going to be miles in the sky, mm -hmm. 15, 20 miles in the sky, and they were whole five days they could see a little thing as a, as a rodent walking on, 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 the, um, on the ground. <laughs> you understand? So an eagle is a bird of prey. You know, and what did Esau do? What is Esau doing? He's praying on the nations. You understand? So there's a reason why he took that, that symbol, the eagle. Yeah, let's get some more attributes of Edom. Go ahead. Verse 4, though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars. Now I heard that this is a wrong breakdown. The stars is not the way the stars. Nope. Understand. Is, do we have GPS today? Yeah. Why do we have GPS today? What is used to give us a GPS? Where are satellites located? 
How did they get up there? Man went up there and put them up there, right? Do we have space stations? Do we have space stations? Someone said no. no. Yes, we have space stations. How did they get up there? Now, some will say, well, not America. Russia did it. What's a Russia symbol? What nation is Russians? White people. It's a damn difference. Whether Russia or America, both of them are Edomites, result in some as an eagle. They're brothers. Sibling rivalry among them, but they're still brothers and the same. Go ahead. Hey, you know the main reason how you know that? Because to German, Russian, uh, French, what did they add to that name? Caucasian. Yeah, I was going to say that too. Uh, damn. That's, yeah. Yep. They are Caucasian. They say I'm German Caucasian. British. French Caucasian. Mm-hmm. British Caucasian. Jewish Caucasian. They all Caucasians from the Caucasus Mountains. That's who they are. They're the Edomites. And before they was put up there in those Caucasus Mountains, they was called Edomites. Mm-hmm. Idumians. I- Edomites. They know who they are. We're going to prove that out their own books too. For some odd reason, the most I put, well, the, well, some odd reason, the most I put in the spirit of our enemies to tell on themselves. <laughs> Go ahead. Though well, thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. So once they've accomplished this task of setting their nest among the stars, which they have successfully done, which we have in our phones as proof, obviously, GPS, you driving around. If you put satellite, you look at a house, you, hit satellite, you can see the top of the house from space. You can even zoom in from space. You got the movie Eagle Eyed. You got uh, Syriana. They shoot lasers from there now. So it's no fairy tale. They're up there. So whenever they got up there, they up there. So the most I said, once you do that, I'm going to start bringing you down. That's when, that's when the most I was going to start preparing war. You give him all the weapons he can give him to make a spectacular battle in the end. The proof that this man knows about this scripture, when he went up in space and he landed on the moon, what did he say? Tranquility base here. The eagle has landed. Rocket twink. Tranquility. We copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. The eagle has landed because they know that this Bible is talking about them. The scholars of their, of the, of their system, they know that. Yep. And their scholars told them to tell them that. Yep. When you get up there, we're going to defy God. God said he's going to bring us down. Well, they say, okay, but well, when we get up there, the eagle has landed. Now what? That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to mock God. You got Jake saying that that was a hoax, that didn't really happen. Well, guess what? If it happened back then, they got up there. The Negro was a hoax. Yeah. <laughs> Not the history in the Bible. So if that was a hoax, guess what? That was rehearsal. They got up there. Okay? Enough of that. Good. Yeah, read on. Verse 5. If thieves came to thee, if robbers by night, how art thou cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? Giving you an attribute of this nation, how they would steal and they take everything. A robber goes into a home, he steals what he can carry. Esau goes into a home and steals the home, takes the damn home itself with the people in the home and says that it says theirs. Kick the residents out and move in there and says it's my house the whole time. That's what he does. This is an attribute of Edom. Red, prideful, cave dwellers, eagle symbol, in space, thieves. It's a very small, you narrow it down to the, to the what do you call the term? Um... Lowest common denominator, who else would it be? They ain't Arabs. Arabs aren't in space. Thank you. Process of elimination. Thank you. Go ahead. If the grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? Right. If grape gatherers came to your land, would they not leave some grapes for some to come and after and take some? You got to take all the grapes. That's their nature. To steal until everything is gone. Steal people, steal land, steal nationalities. Steal every inventions, steal everything. Go ahead. How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? Gonna find out tonight. <laughs> Verse 7. All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived. That's going back to verse 1 about rise up against her in battle. Her comrades are eventually gonna turn on her. They'll go to Revelations. That's, that's later on in class. If we can get there. But that goes into the nations eventually turning against her. Go ahead. And prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. 
There is none understanding in him. There's no understanding in Esau. Go ahead. Shall I not in that day, saith the Lord, even destroy the wise men out of Edom? Right. Then he's going to destroy their satellites, their scientists, all that's going to be destroyed, dismayed. Go ahead. And understanding out of the mount of Esau? Go ahead. And thy mighty men, O Teman. Their wise men, their scientists, their scholars. Go ahead. Shall be dismayed. When the war starts. Go ahead. World War Three. Go ahead. To the end that every one of the Mount of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. This is every one of the Mount of Esau. Every one. Not few. Not the good ones. Every one of them. The end result of them is complete and utter annihilation. Genocide. God's hit list. Psalms 83. Number one on the hit list. Go ahead. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob. This is the reason why. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob. Go ahead. Shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. You shall be killed off forever. Never to, never to come again. Never to return again. Go ahead. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces. The strangers is going into Babylon. Babylon attacked us. The Edomites assisted in the destruction of Jerusalem when the Babylonians came in. And the Most High held that against them to the fullest. The Most High was pissed off about that. So from that action is the reason why the Most High says, I'm going to kill all of you off. Just from that alone. That's coming out of Psalms 137, uh, 7 to 9. Yep. That's where that scripture fits in it. Yep. Go ahead. And foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem. Even thou was as one of them. Even thou was as one of the Babylonians. That's why he's called the daughter of Babylon, even thou wast as one of them, just like Babylon. Go ahead. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. That we were taken out of our land in exile and became stranger, as a piece of us being called strangers. Go ahead. Neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. He didn't, he didn't have to rejoice when we were getting killed by the Babylonians and our temples being destroyed and our houses burned down. Our white women were being taken captive and raped in front of us. Go ahead. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Go ahead. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Because they helped the Babylonians. Watch. Yea. Thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. They laid hands on us. They took our stuff. They robbed, they saw robbed us while Babylon was pillaging and destroying us. Go ahead. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway. And when Israel found a way to escape, Esau blocked it off so we couldn't leave. Go ahead. To cut off those of his that did escape. So we escaped the Babylonians. We ran to the Edomites that brought us back to the Babylonians to sell us. Go ahead. Neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. 15. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen. The day of the Lord is near upon not just you, but all of you nations. The day of my day is near upon you all. Go ahead. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. Go ahead. For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. We rule no longer. Get, get put in slavery. Let's get Psalms 137. Psalms 137, verse 7. Mm -hmm. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom. Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom. Go ahead. In the day of Jerusalem, who said, race it, race it. Even to the foundation thereof. Referring to the temple. Raise it, raise it even to the foundation thereof. Bring Jerusalem down to the ground. Destroy it all. They also, I said they were rejoicing. Yeah, destroy it. Yeah, like an audience. They were watching the Babylonians come in there and destroy our houses, our temple. And they helped. Go ahead. O daughter of Babylon. What do you call Edom? O daughter of Babylon. He called Edom the daughter of Babylon. Edom is called the daughter of Babylon. Go ahead. Who are to be destroyed. This goes back to Obadiah. Who are to be destroyed. Go ahead. Happy shall he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. Go ahead. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. We're going to take their little ones when we're ruling and bash them babies up against them rocks. Like they did to us. All right. So Esau is also referred to as the daughter of Babylon. Keep that in mind. Ezekiel 35, verse 1. 
Ezekiel 35, verse 1. Ezekiel, chapter 35 and verse 1. Let me read to verse 5. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir. Remember that word. Remember that place. That's where Edom dwelt. Set thy face against Mount Seir. So Mount Seir is synonymous with Edom. Seir is synonymous with Edomites. Go ahead. And prophesy against it. And we're doing that tonight, which I was told we can't do. No. Prophesy against them. Go ahead. And say unto it, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against thee, and I will stretch out mine hand against thee, and I will make thee most desolate. I'm going to destroy you. Go ahead. I will lay thy cities waste, and thou shalt be desolate, and, though, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Go ahead. Because thou hast had a perpetual hatred. Stop. Thou hast had a perpetual hatred, a hatred that has passed down from lineage to lineage to lineage. From their forefather hating Jacob, the Lord passed off of him, and it went into his children. The hatred never left Edom. It's always been there. It is still there today. Go ahead. Because thou hast had a perpetual hatred and hast shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity. So they helped the Babylonians kill us. And they remember, remember Esau is blessed with what? The art of war. The sword. Go ahead. In the time that their iniquity had an end. Uh, 36 verse 1. 36, verse 1. Mm -hmm. Also, thou son of man, prophesy unto the mountains of Israel, and say, ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, because the enemy hath said against you, Aha, even the ancient high places are ours in possession. Even the ancient, our enemies have said to us, Aha, we have your land now, like they do today. Yeah, we, we've been here for the hundreds of years. We are the Jews. Damn, devil's a liar. Lion. Aha, we have your ancient places in our possession. Let's get Psalms 83. We're going to come back to Ezekiel. We have the ancient places in our This is a heathen I've said. We have the ancient places in our possession. Well, why are they saying that? Psalms 83, verse 3 to 5. The book of Psalms. 83, verse 3. Chapter 83, verse 3. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people. Now read verse 2. Verse 2. For lo, thine enemies. God's enemies. Make a tumult. Angry gathering. And they that hate thee. That have, hate our God. Go ahead. Have lifted up the head. Have gained pride. Power. Go ahead. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people. God's enemies have taken crafty counsel against his people. Thinking he's just sitting there watching it go on. Like he ain't going to do nothing about it. Go ahead. And consulted against thy hidden ones. And they have consulted among themselves against us while our nationality remained hidden and became, and became hidden through the, them enslaving us. Go ahead. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation. They all consented. They all counseled us to let us cut them off from, from being a nation. Go ahead. That the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. Not only in our members, but the whole world. You ask the people today, nations are not. Who are the real Jews? They're going to point to the white folks. So our true nationality is said not only to us, but to the world. Go ahead. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. Against our God. Go ahead. The tabernacles of Edom. So Edom is number one on God's hit list. Like you know says? God's hit list. Number one. Go ahead. And the Ishmaelites. The Arabs. Number two. Because they're the second worst. They have us in slavery. Even so now they have us in slavery. So they're the second worst. Go ahead. Of Moab. Moab had us in slavery also. The Song, Ming, and Tang dynasty. Tang, whatever. Tang, Tang, Ching, Chong, whatever. Had us in damn captivity also. Whom the Israelites sold us to. Go ahead. And the Hagarines. Africans. That's all I want. Jump down to verse um, 11. Verse 11. Make their nobles like Oreb. And like Z. Being dead. We killed them. Go ahead. Yea, all their princes as Zaba and Zalmuna. Who we killed. Go ahead. Who said. Who said, watch this. Who said what? Let us take to ourselves the houses of God in possession. Let us take to ourselves the houses of God in our possession. The house is referring to the nation itself as well as our land. Take them land, those houses into our possession. 
Because remember, the so-called got into the land based upon who? The British Mandate and the League of Nations in 1948. All the nations got together and said, put these imposters in there. They are all t together on that stuff. All, they were all in on it together to put those, these heathens in our land which the Israelites had in their possession before that Esau took over, the majority of it. You follow? Yes, All right. Let's get Ezekiel 36 again. Going back there again. Ezekiel 36. And we're going to read verse 3 to 5. Ezekiel 36, verse 3. Therefore prophesy and say, thus saith the Lord God, because they have made you desolate and swallowed you up on every side. Right, took us out of our land. That ye might be a possession unto the residue of the heathen. Uh -huh. And ye are taken up in the lips of talkers. We're accused of, slandered, go ahead. And are in infamy of the people. The by words, niggas, coons, spicks, wetbacks, go ahead. Therefore. Cushy, um, um, abid, go ahead. Therefore, ye mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God to the mountains, and to the hills, to the rivers, and to the valleys, to the desolate wastes, and to the cities that are forsaken, which became a prey, and derision to the residue of the heathen that are round about. Us, go ahead. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God. Watch this. Surely, in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the heathen. Watch this. And against all Idumia. Against all Idumia, because he was the ringleader behind our land being taken out of our possession. Go ahead. Which have appointed my land into their possession. So all Idumia has appointed our land into their possession. Let's go deeper. They took our land and possession over there and took our land in their possession over here too. America is our promised land also. Lost tribes and promised lands, plural. Because Deuteronomy 33 promises that America will be our possession as well as Ezra 13. So this is our promised land as well. So that shows you that these scholars are not stupid because like I pointed out in an earlier class, this man, Ronald Sanders, he did not name this because he didn't know what he was doing. He named his book Lost Tribes and Promised Lands because he knew. He knew the history. He knew the Bible. He knows the people. Okay? That's why I said a lot of times these names go over people's heads, but Deacon Ithon is doing a superb job in bringing out that information. So that's correct. Go ahead. Hey, let me get Zechariah 2 and 7 and read that real quick. Because remember what we read early on in Obadiah, right? We, we read early on that Edom is called, is called what? It's called the daughter of Babylon. All right? So, you got it? Yes, sir. Right. Zechariah 2 verse 7. Deliver thyself, O Zion that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. So it says, deliver thyself, O Zion. Who is Zion? Zion is the nation of Israel. Okay? Zion that what? That dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. So when is Zion dwelling with the daughter of Babylon, which is who? Edom. All right? So when, is, when was Zion start dwelling with the daughter of Babylon, which is Edom? It's talking about now. You understand? It's talking about now. That's why I said, deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. Be yeah, because that goes into come out of her, my people, and all of that. You understand? Because at, at the time where this was written, you know, who, we was, who was ruling over us? The Babylonians. The, no, the Persians. Then you had the, the um, Babylonians came afterwards and so forth. You know? Ah. <laughs> You know, but came before, the Persian Babylonians after. came before, the Persians came after. You understand? So the scripture said, deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwelling with the daughter of Babylon, which is the so-called white man. Right. All right? So, you know, the way we deliver with service is by coming up out of the lies and so forth that is set up here in America. Right. Verse 5 again. We'll finish it off. Zechariah? Ezekiel 36. Oh, Ezekiel. All yeah. right. Verse 5. Ezekiel 36, verse 5. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the heathen uh -huh. and against all Idumia, who was a ringleader, go ahead, which have appointed my land 
into their possession uh -huh. with the joy of all their heart, uh -huh. with despiteful minds to cast it out for a prey. We'll invite heathens to come into our land for touring, come visit the land, all of that. That's our land. It shouldn't be in the first place, so they cast it out for a prey. That's what they do. Go ahead. Let me jump to verse uh, 11. Verse 11. And I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bring fruit. And I will settle you after your old estates. We're back in our own land, go ahead. And will do better unto you than at your beginnings. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. I'm gonna do better with you in the last, um, after the last days than I did with you in the beginning. Go ahead. Better blessings. Verse 12. Watch yes. This. I will cause men to walk upon you, even my people Israel, and they shall possess thee, and thou shalt be their inheritance. And thou shalt no more henceforth bereave them of men. We're referring to losing, referring to the men. We're referring to the land. Um, what's that? It says blasphemy. Hold on a second. I'm trying to find that verse. It mentions blasphemy somewhere here. Uh, so listen, man. Esau is a devil according to the Bible. You understand? <laughs> Everybody agree with that? Yeah, yeah man. Esau is a devil the Bible speaks of. The scripture said we got to deliver ourselves from, from when that, that those of us that's dwelling with the daughter of Babylon. All right? You got it? Yeah, 35 and 12. I missed that one. 35 verse 12. Ezekiel 35 and verse 12. Uh -huh. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, and that I have heard all thy blasphemies which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel. He has heard all of Esau's blasphemies. He spoke against the children of Israel. He has heard all of Esau's blasphemies against the children of Israel. Keep that in mind, the blasphemies. We're going to visit that later on. What blasphemies? Let's get first Ezra, just at the Apocrypha, 1 verse 50. First Ezra, just 1 and verse 50. I'm going to prove once again that the Apocrypha is a valid book. It's not non-canon that the heathen try to portray it to be. And it's in their own books once again. First Ezra 1, verse 50 and 51. First Ezra chapter 1 and verse 50. Nevertheless, the God of their fathers sent by his messenger to call them back because he spared them and his tabernacle also. Yeah. But they had his messengers in derision. And look, when the Lord spake unto them, they made a sport of his prophets. Master prophets. Go ahead. So far, so far forth. That he, being wroth with his people for, th high, for their great ungodliness, commanded the kings of the Chaldees to come up against them. Send Babylon against us for being so wicked. Go ahead. Who slew their young men with the sword. Uh -huh. Yea, even within the compass of their holy temple, and spared neither young man nor maid, old man nor child. Babylon came in, killed men, women, and children, and Esau assisted that. Go ahead. Among them. For he delivered all into their hands. And they took the rest captive. Go ahead. And they took all the holy vessels of the Lord, both great and small, with the vessels of the ark of God and the king's treasurers, and carried them away into Babylon. They robbed the temple. Go ahead. As for the house of the Lord, they burnt it and break down the walls of Jerusalem. He burnt that temple down to the ground and destroyed the walls of Jerusalem. Go ahead. And set fire upon her towers. Uh -huh. and, as, as, and as for her glorious things... They never ceased till they had consumed and brought them all to naught. They destroyed everything glorious. Go ahead. And the people that were not slain with the sword he carried unto Babylon. But they didn't die, wasn't the slavery. Go ahead. Who became servants to him and his children till the Persians reigned to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremy. Because Babylon's rule was temporary until Persia came into power. Go ahead. Until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, the whole time of her desolation shall she rest. Until the full term of 70 years. Chapter 2, verse 1. So we went for 70 years and got overthrown. Go ahead. Chapter 2, verse 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of the Persians, that the word of the Lord might be accomplished, that he had promised by the mouth of Jeremy. Mm -hmm. the Lord, Jeremiah, go ahead. Jer Jeremiah. The Lord raised up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of the Persians, and he made proclamation through all his kingdom, and also by writing. Saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of the Persians, the Lord of Israel, the most high Lord, hath made me king of the whole world, and commanded me to build him in house at Jerusalem in Jury. If therefore there be any of you that are of his people, 
Let the Lord, even his Lord, be with him. And let him go up to Jerusalem that is in Judea and build the house of the Lord of Israel. For he is the Lord that dwelleth in Jerusalem. So it was prophesied by Isaiah that he was going to raise up a Persian named Cyrus to allow us to return from exile of Babylon to rebuild our temple and our city once again. Isaiah prophesied of this 150 years before his time. He mentioned him by name in Isaiah 45, Cyrus. And, now, and Cyrus came 150 years later, proving the, Bible's a, proving the Bible's a prophetic book. Go ahead. Whosoever then dwell in the places about, let them help him. Those, I say, that are his neighbors, with gold and with silver, with gifts, with horses, and with cattle, and other things, which have been set forth by vow for the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem. Then the chief of the families of Judea and of the tribe of Benjamin stood up, the priests also, and the Levites, and all they whose mind the Lord had moved to go up. Northern kingdom. And to build in house for the Lord at Jerusalem. Go ahead. And they that dwelt round about them, and help them in all things with silver and gold, with horses and cattle, and with very many free gifts of a great number whose minds were stirred up thereto. Yeah. King Cyrus also brought forth the, the holy vessels which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem. Because, because the Persians took over what Babylon took and had in possession. They just moved in and took all, took all the stuff they had in, in their possession, their vaults, and gave it back to us. Go ahead. And had set up in his temple of idols. Now when Cyrus, king of the Persians, had brought them forth, he delivered them to Mithridus, his treasurer. And by him they were delivered to Sanabasar, the governor of Judea. And this was the number of them, a thousand golden cups and a thousand of silver, censers of silver, 29, vials of gold, 30, and of silver, 2,410, and a thousand other vessels. So Persian, the Persian king Cyrus set up his men to help assist us in returning all our wealth, all our glorious possessions to the temple back into our possession to make sure we got it all back. All right. Now let's get chapter um, real quick. Chapter four, verse 13. First Ezra, chapter four, verse 13. Then the third who had spoken of woman and of the truth. This was Zerubbabel began to speak. So this is Zerubbabel was the, was the um, bodyguard of the king. Um, Artaxerxes, I believe. Artaxerxes, no, he was the king of, he was, I believe, the bodyguard of Darius. He was the bodyguard of Darius. He was the, one of the immortals. All right? And this is, this is um, when Israel got their freedom to return to the land of exile to rebuild Jerusalem. So Zubabel was one of the first, as well as Joshua, one of the first ones to return from exile to rebuild what the Babylonians had destroyed. Y'all follow? Yes, sir. So Israel returned under Cyrus's proclamation to return and rebuild our city that the Babylonians had once destroyed. We read that earlier. Go ahead. Um, four, that was 13. Yes, sir. Chapter, go to um, verse 42. Verse so 40. Wrote, I'm sorry. So the, out of the three bodyguards, Superbell being one of them, he, they, they all wrote a letter regarding three different topics, I believe. Wine, women, the truth, and so forth, things of that nature. And, and Superbell's letter won the contest. So he got what he, whatever he wanted, he, whatever he desired, at the request of the king, he got it as a reward for the letter he wrote down. Y'all follow? So we're going to read what he asked. Verse uh, 42. Then said the king unto him, Ask what thou wilt more than is appointed in the writing, and we will give it thee, because thou art found wisest, and thou shalt sit next me, and shalt be called my cousin. So due to this, since, since you wrote this excellent letter regarding women and the truth, you went, you went, but you, just, just a, you showed your wisdom, you're going to gain status of me in the kingdom. What do you desire? What do you want? Go ahead. Then said he unto the king, Remember thy vow, which thou hast vowed to build Jerusalem, in the day when thou camest to thy kingdom, and to send away all the vessels that were taken away out of Jerusalem, which Cyrus set apart. Your great-grandfather set apart. Go ahead. When he vowed to destroy Babylon and to send them again thither. Right. You had in your records that it was your, object your objective to return all the possessions that Israel lost back into our possession. Go ahead. Thou also hast vowed to build up the temple. Watch this. Which the Edomites burned when Judea was made desolate by the Chaldees. Which the Edom, so the Edomites burned the temple to the ground. While the Babylonians came in, killing us, knocking on our walls, Esau, Ezra is giving us understanding of what the, Edom, what the Edomites did. They burnt the temple down. Okay. That's what it meant again in Psalms when they said, race it, race, race it, it, even to the foundation thereof. They were burning it down. The Edomites did, vicious demons did that, went right. burnt it down. So that's, you, 
It's beautiful. You're bringing out that history. That's beautiful. 46. And now, O Lord the King, this is that which I require and which I desire of thee. And this is the, the princely liberality proceeding from thyself. I desire, therefore, that thou make good the vow, the performance whereof with thine own mouth thou hast vowed to the king of heaven. Go ahead. Then Darius the king stood up and kissed him and wrote letters for him unto all the treasurers and lieutenants and captains and governors, that they should safely convey on their way both him and all those that go up with him to build Jerusalem. He gave Zubabel the permission to return, to leave his job, and to, and to help and rebuild what the Babylonians had burned down, which the Edomites helped them burn down to rebuild the temple. Zubabel's job, along with Joshua's spiritual guidance, was to rebuild the temple up. And Nehemiah Ezra came later to rebuild the walls that were knocked down and the houses that were burned. That's what Nehemiah and Ezra did, later, way later on. Go ahead. He wrote letters also unto the lieutenants that were in Celesyria mm -hmm. and Phoenice, and unto them in Libanus, that they should bring cedar wood from Libanus uh -huh. unto Jerusalem. And, they, and that they should build the city with him. Right. Moreover, he wrote for all the Jews that went out of his realm up in Jury, into Jury, concerning their freedom, that no officer, no ruler, no lieutenant, nor treasurer should forcibly enter into their doors. Right. Watch this. And that all the country which they hold should be free without tribute. No more taxes. Watch, watch this. And that the Edomites should give over the villages of the Jews which then they held. What did Esau do? They took our land. They took portions of our land from us. After they helped the Babylonians burn it to the ground, they said, let's live here. It's nice here. Because the Babylonians took us out, they moved right in. That's what Esau does. Remember in Ezekiel, let's take this land into our possession. They always had a lust for our land. Mm -hmm. Always. They did the same thing in this country with what they call urban removal. Yep, okay. manifest destiny. Let's go to First Maccabees 5 and 65. We'll jump down to 65. Is it 65? No. Yeah, 565. First Maccabees, chapter 5, verse 65. Go to the second. Let me make sure. Hold on. Yeah, 1 Maccabees 5.65. Go there. 1 Maccabees 5.65. Yeah. Afterward went Judas forth with his, with his brethren. This is during the time of the Greeks now. Maccabees, go ahead. And fought against the children of Esau. Why? Right. Watch this. In the land toward the south, where he smote Hebron. He smote Hebron was our land. Go ahead. And the towns thereof. And pulled down the fortress of it and burned the towers thereof round about. So we took our land, Hebron, back from Edom. That's during the time of the Greeks. So we pushed them, so we had the Cyrus, the Persian king, take them out of our land. Some of them still remain there. They put themselves back in there again. We kicked them out. They ended up back in there again during the time of the Greeks. They always had a, they always wanted our land. They always want to be in our land. Nothing new. Let's get the new, my link. I want the new West, I want the new Westminster Dictionary. The new Westminster Dictionary. We're going to look up, um, Edomites at the New Westminster Dictionary. That's this right here. It's on the screen. That's this right here, this book. Still stuff in here. Okay, right there. Now, blow that up so everybody can see it. Read that cap for us. Okay, start from for a number of years. Start from there. For a number of years, under Tiglath Pileser III, Shalomaneser the fourth, the fifth, Sargon. Sennacherib, 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 Asaradon, Asaradon, Ashurbanipal, and Ashurbanipal, Edom was a, a vassal state of Assyria, uh -huh. but would join coalitions in revolt, Go 711 ahead. and 701 BC. Go ahead. The Edomites rejoiced when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem. That's an estrus. The Edomites rejoiced when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem. Go ahead. The so read, the, read the scripture it has. Psalms 137 and 7. You just read that. Go ahead. The prophets, the prophets... Hold on, bro. Don't, don't go down. Foretold. The prophets foretold the calamities that should befall Edom for its inveterate enmity toward Israel. Its hatred towards Israel. Go ahead. Watch this. Ezekiel 35, 5 to 6. But announce its ultimate in incorporation into the kingdom of God. Out its land. Because we're going to kill the people out the land. 
When the captivity of the two tribes... Benjamin, it's Judah, Benjamin, and Remus of Levi. Go ahead. When the captivity of the two tribes rendered the territory of Judah somewhat destitute of inhabitants... Somewhat, some, somewhat means some of us are still there, like the poor, like Habeka. Go ahead. The Edomites seized on it as far as Hebron. See, that's a, and that's why Jewish Maccabees went in there and killed them out as far as Hebron. Go ahead. And were themselves supplanted in Mount Seir. And they themselves lost portions of their land. Go ahead. By who? By the Nabataeans. The Nabataeans were, well now here's the thing, here's the tricky one. The Nabataeans without a doubt are Arabs. The argument is that they say that, some say that the Nabataeans are the children or descendants of Nabajoth. Nabajoth is a descendant of Ishmael. Some say that's not true, some say it is true. I say it is because Esau and, and, and Nabajoth always intermarried. Esau always married Arabs. That's why you got Negroes saying that they're Arabs. They did not, they're not Arabs, they intermarried with Arabs. That you had um, Nabataeans are Arabs. But um, Esau himself married the sister of Nabayoth, a newbie Genesis, all right, an Arab woman or Ishmaelite woman. But I'll leave it, I'll leave it in the air. I'll, I'll just say for now, so no one can argue and say I'm making things up. I'll say Arabs took over portions of Mount Seir. Not all of it, because Mount Esau would um, maintain most of it, but the Arabs, the Batians, took some land of it as well in their possession. Y'all follow? So the Arab Nabataeans took some portions of Mount Seir the way they took portions of our land. It happened to them. Go ahead. The political power of Edom was really completely at an end when Nabonidus made Tema his place of residence. Taman. So that's when the Babylonians took some of their land over as well. Took them out there. That's Taman. Is Tema. Taman is the you know, Taman, capital. That's their wise men. Nabonidus took some. Nabonidus is the father of Belshazzar. Once again, Nabonidus is the father of Belshazzar and Daniel. Okay? That's why he told Daniel that you'll be third in the kingdom because you had Nabonidus. Belshazzar, and then Daniel came in third. All right? Read on. Judas Maccabeus retook Hebron and the other towns that the Edomites had occupied. Just, right here, watch what it says. John High Crane. Don't read the scripture. Judas Maccabeus retook Hebron and the other towns that the Edomites had occupied. Uh -huh. First Maccabees 565. If it's not canon, why quote it for? It's in the dictionary. Go ahead. John High Cranus compelled the Edomites to submit to the right of circumcision mm -hmm. and incorporated them with the Jewish people. Uh -huh. Go ahead. The Herods were Idumians. The Herods Edomites. were Idumians, i.e., an example, Edomites. So the Herods were Edomites. And John Icranus, so when Israel began to expand, we, we got to Esau's land. So listen, you're either going to convert or we're going to kill you out the land. So they said, okay, we're going to convert them. We're going to follow the laws. Like in Leviticus 25, we had heathens, we had Canaanites, Hamites. We took their land over and go, listen, you either going to be slaves and convert and follow a way of life or we'll just kill you out the land. They chose to be our slaves and convert. Likewise, Esau, the same thing. When, see, yeah. when John Icranus, who was Simon's son of the Maccabees, John Icranus is the son. You read the last book of Maccabees, the last chapter, it mentions John. That's John Icranus. Because Simon was killed and his brothers were killed. He's a, he, was, he, he survived. Okay. Hey, um, can I say one thing? When you look at the history of Herod, Herod history goes back to these Jewish people that yeah. was convert. Yep. All right? When you look at the history, it go right back to these Jewish people yep. that was convert. So the Jewish people that we see in society today running around calling themselves the Jews, where did they, where did they start? They started all the way back. Mm -hmm. You understand? Right here, yep. they was forced to convert to Judaism. Yep. I mean, to, 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 to keep our laws and right. so forth in the land of Edom. Right. You understand? They was forced by John Hycranius to do that. Is John Hycranius, he said? Yep, John Hycranius, yeah. Right, John Hycranius forced them to do that. Uh -huh. And that's the line. Them is the same people that Herod come from. When you look into the history of Herod, that's the people that Herod came from. Those are his children. You understand? That, that, that welling water you had this to, that's Herod's wall. That's not our wall. Right, how I built that wall. They humping it, humping the wall. Did y'all hear that? Your perps. Yep, because they couldn't enter into the temple. You understand? Right. So they was always outside the wall doing that. Right. They doing the they worshiping. That's when we were, That's why when you read the scripture, it says that Herod and them they was well versed in the customs of the Jew. That? Yep. All right. Get, get page four eighteen. Same book. Page four eighteen. So while he's getting there real quick, y'all know that that's not the original wall of Solomon, right? Because that wall was destroyed in 70 AD. Yep. So that's the y'all. Nobody should be. So when they banging their head up against the wall, that ain't that ain't the wall that that's was built. With, that's their daddy's wall. 
I do me a. You read the whole thing. All right. I do me a. Just read it fast. An AV of OT and Apocrypha. Right. It's an AV advised in OT and Apocrypha. Old Testament and Apocrypha. So they're including the Apocrypha in the Bible. Go ahead. The name used by Greeks and Romans. So the term I do me a is a Greco Roman term of, of Edom. Go ahead. In slightly different spelling for the country of Edom. After the fall of Jerusalem in 586 B.C., the Edomites began to press north. They themselves were driven from Petra west by the Nabataeans. By the Arabs. By the Arabs. Go ahead. Who were established there by 312 B.C. And who, before the middle of the second century B.C., were occupying not only South Judah, but also Hebron. Just read that. Go ahead. And the country to its north, as far as Bethzor. Judas Maccabeus warred against them successfully, mm -hmm. and John Hycranus, about 126 B.C., completely subjugated them, enslaved them, go ahead, and placed them under a Jewish governor. We set our people over them in that land to follow our laws. Okay, we set a governor of our people in the land. You guys are gonna follow this, do it that way, this way, and that way. And time always repeats itself. These things, nothing new under the sun. This happened before. This happens again. Let's get, um, that also has there. Damn. Uh, and out of that group came Antipater. Mm -hmm. Out of that group came Antipater, or Antipater, who was a father of Herod. And, Her and Antipater married an Abatean woman and had Herod. I'm going to say it again. Antipater was the counselor of, of, of John Aquinas' grandson. He caused an e issue between the two brothers fighting over power. And then eventually he took over himself. He got killed and it took, it put his son in power under the, guy, under the power of the Romans. All right? So out of those groups that were subjugated came Antipater, or Antipater, who was, his wife was a, um, an Abatian, and they had the Herodian dynasty, the Herods, that you read about in the Bible. Matthew 2, verse 1. That's in the air. Matthew 2, verse 1. We're going to read Matthew 2, verse 1, for a reason. Matthew 2, verse 1. You read, about, you read about the same Herod. He's called Herod the Great. He's in Luke 1 and 5, and he's in Matthew 2 and 1. Matthew, chapter 2, verse 1. And now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Matter of fact, get Luke 1, verse 5 first. Get that first, real quick. I want that for a reason. Luke 1, verse 5, then Matthew 2. Luke 1 and verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea. Stop, so, read again. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea. So this is in the days of Herod, he was the king of the Jews. Who should be king of the Jews? No, who, uh, what, what race should you be as a king of the Jews? Israel. Israel. This guy was, what was he? An Edomite. Reigning over, the, reigning over the land once again. Based upon the Romans' order, which are also Edomites. Go to Matthew now. Edomite became king of Judea. Somehow. Matthew 2, verse 1. Matthew, chapter 2, verse 1. Now, when Jesus was Hold born... On, go ahead. Right, y'all should know about what, what the question that Deacon I thought I mentioned about having another nation over us because that's in God's law. We're only supposed to set up Israelites over us. Right. When you read Deuteronomy, that's what it tells you. Right. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Uh -huh. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? Yeah. For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. Go ahead. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with, with him. And when he had gathered all Mike's the... Mike's going out. Your mic is falling down. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together... This is Herod. Go ahead. He demanded of them where Christ should be born. Go ahead. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet... And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people they Israel. Quote, they quote a Micah 5 and 2. Go ahead. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently 
what time the star appeared. So a chariot appeared in the sky. A chariot appeared and they said, what's this, what's this chariot about? It goes, the king, our king is, our king has been, our king is born and has been here for a certain amount, amount of time. Okay, and, th and this child that's born will be king of the Jews. Remember, he was king of the Jews. So he's asking our people, well, where's this child going to be born at? In Bethlehem. Okay, well, where's the child at? Continue. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search diligently for the young child. Go get this child. I want to see him. And when he have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Liar. Go ahead. When they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which, Chariot, go ahead. which they saw in the east went before them. The star told them where to go. I said, no, it wasn't a regular star in space. It was a chariot that led them where the child was. Go ahead. Till it came and stood over where the young child was. It stood over the house where the child was living with his parents. Go ahead. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. The wise men knew what it was. Go ahead. And when they were come into the house... They saw the young child with Mary, his mother. Now, notice it says young child. He wasn't an infant. He was a toddler. A young child. I'll prove it to you. A young child with his mother. Go ahead. With, with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. They gave the child gifts, not each other gifts, like it's damn Christmas. It's nonsense. Go ahead. They gave the child gifts. Go ahead. And being warned of God in a dream... That they should not return to Herod. So God told these wise men, listen, don't return to Herod and tell, 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 tell that man where he is. Go somewhere else. Go ahead. They departed into their own country another way. Go ahead. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt. Flee to Africa. Go ahead. And be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. What's Herod trying to do? For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Herod wants to kill this child because he wants to remain king of Judea and not this child to be king of Judea. Go ahead. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod. So he died. Go ahead. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophets, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Jose 11 and 1. Go ahead. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men. The wise men, the wise men didn't come back to him and tell him where he was. Go ahead. Was exceeding wroth. Got pissed off. And sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. It's called the blood of the innocents. He killed all the males. Watch this. Watch how old he killed them from. Go ahead. And in all the coast thereof. From killed all the males and all the coast thereof. Go ahead. From two years old and under. No, he stole, he stole the children. He, I'm sorry. He killed the children. Period. The males. Read again. Read again. I'm sorry. And in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under. Why did he kill the children two years old and under? Watch this. Go ahead. According to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So the star was sitting out there for two years. So the child was born. All that was alive. The child was alive for two years. So he killed all the children from the time the star was sitting out there. Two years and under. So in Matthew, he was a young child. He was two years here. Two years old here. Luke, he's an infant. Matthew, he's a young child. Because Luke go before Matthew. Y'all follow what I'm saying? Yes, sir. All right. Now, let's go to, so, he, so remember, Herod sought to kill this child. Remember? He sought to kill the child. Let's get Revelations uh, 12 and 1. Revelations 12 and 1. I mentioned to you earlier that Herod was set up as king over Judea by the hand of the Romans. He was a Roman affiliate. Herod, he was part of the Roman Empire. He was a Roman. They called him, they referred to him as a Roman affiliate. Go ahead. Revelations chapter 12, verse 1. Uh-huh. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet. Wisdom, light. Go ahead. And upon her head a crown of 12 stars. What are those 12 stars? 12 tribes of Israel. Go ahead. And she being with child cried. And this woman being with child cried. Go ahead. Travailing in birth. And pain to be delivered. It was, time, it, was time, it was the time for the Messiah to come into the world. Go ahead. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. So aside from this woman, appeared another wonder aside from this woman, aside from this sister with twelve with, with a um, crown on her head with twelve stars, appeared another wonder. Go ahead. And behold, a great red dragon. Great red dragon. Great red dragon. Go ahead. Having seven heads and ten horns. This dragon had seven heads, 
Seven heads on his body, and it had ten horns on each on the heads. Go ahead. And seven crowns upon his heads. And each head had a crown on it. Go ahead. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. His tail, which is part of his body, which is red also, drew the third part, which would be Judah, Benjamin, and Levi in subjugation and captivity. Go ahead. And did cast them to the earth. And did put us in their, in their um, rulership, under their rulership. Go ahead. That's how Herod became our king, under Roman rulership. Go ahead. And the dragon stood before the woman. Now this dragon with the seven heads and ten horns and crowns upon seven heads stood before the woman that was pregnant. Go ahead. Which was ready to be delivered. Which is ready to give birth. Go ahead. For to devour her child as soon as it was born. When did this happen? Where? Matthew 2. Who was this person? Herod. Right. And who was the baby? Correct. So... Herod is part of this what? What's Herod part of in this verse? He's part of what beast? The great red dragon, right? Let's go back in time. You have Daniel. Daniel mentions four particular beasts. You recall? The four beasts of Daniel. Some of y'all maybe knew. Mm -hmm. Daniel mentions four beasts. Luke calls it the time of the Gentiles. You have Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, right? The first beast was a lion. Mm -hmm. That's with the wings. That's Nebuchadnezzar, right? How many heads does a lion have? That lion has one head. So that, who's that head represent? Nebuchadnezzar. The head, of that, the head of that beast is Nebuchadnezzar, right? The next beast is the bear, right? Who's that beast represent? Who's the head represent? Cyrus, correct, the Persians, right? And he had three ribs in his mouth, which would be the Egyptians, Sabians, Ethiopians. He had them in subjection. Those, that's the three ribs. The next beast is interesting. Is this beast is a leopard having how many heads? Who knows how many heads this leopard has? Four heads. Four heads. The four heads represent kings, right? Kings, leaders of the beast, right? All those heads are part of that beast. So all of those heads are what? They're the same what? Same race, yes. You had Lysimachus, Cassander, Ptolemy. And Seleucus or Seleucus, right? All of them were what? Greeks. All of them were Macedonians, right? All of them are part of the same beast, same race, different dominions of the same beast, right? Then the next beast is, called, is of course, the eagle, which is Rome. We'll get to that another time. Then you have another beast in Revelations, which also has multiple heads, right? Now, this dragon's what color? Red. Mm. And this dragon has how many heads? Seven. Are those heads part of the same body? Yes. What's that mean? The, the heads are what? All the same people. And one of those heads tried to do what? Tried to devour what? And who was that? Herod. And what was Herod? So is Herod part of the beast of the red dragon in Revelations? So if Herod was not do me, what are all the other heads? That's that simple. That means Britain. That means Rome. Greece, Spain, France, Russia, Germany, Britain, all of them are the same people. Regardless of what name they give themselves. They're all part of the same beast, and they all had crowns in their heads. They all had their own dominion. Russia had theirs. France had his. Greece had his. Rome had his crown. And then out of the seventh came what? The eighth, which would be what? America, which is part of that same great red dragon. So the race that comes out of the seventh is uh, was the eighth which is the same race as the seventh, the sixth, the fifth, the fourth, the third, the second, and the first. All the same people. You follow? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's get uh, the Jewish Encyclopedia. Let's get deeper now. The rabbit hole gets deeper. Jewish Encyclopedia, Jewish Encyclopedia, mm -hmm. which they don't want us to have. This was published in, let me show I got an old one too. This was published in 1902, before we even had rights. You know you weren't reading this book. This, is in the, this came from the library of the School of the Ozarks. That's a Christian, that's a, a religious school institution. School of the Ozarks. 1902 publishing, Jewish Encyclopedia, volume 5. I'm sorry, volume 5. The same thing. Volume 5, this was published in, published in 19... Oh, two as well. 
19 to auditions. This is before 1925, this book. Say something real quick yeah. on that. A lot of times when we bring books out here like this here, a lot of these institutions should be throwing away books like this. You follow me? Because after, they, after their scholars and their prestigious uh, uh, doctorates and all of that go through the books, they're done with it. It says it. says it. Dump it. Says it. Right. Dump it. So they'll get rid of it. So a lot of times when these books get thrown out, most people don't pick them up. You know, and they end up getting donated to certain places. And we go into these places and we get them, pick them up. Yeah, it says here, okay. for reference, not to be taken from this room. Ah, well. Well, that's the point that I'm making. We didn't take it. You understand? That when they get rid of these books, yeah. we grab them. Yep. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So it's not, I just wanted to put that out there because I know some people are trying to find anything to say that we're into something wrong. No. I'll tell you right now, man. One of the worst things he saw could have ever done is two things. One, made nuclear bombs. Well, or, or, in terms of his judgment, he should have made that. And number two, letting us know how to read. Worst mistake ever. Worst mistake ever. That's worse than the bombs, as far as I'm concerned. Let's learn how to read. It's the worst. Let's just stop that. Page 41. Um, I want you to read. Let's see what it says. In the time of Nebuchadnezzar. In the time of Nebuchadnezzar, the Edomites took an active part in the plunder of Jerusalem and in the slaughter of the Jews. You got that earlier. Go ahead. It is, it is on account of these cruelties that Edom was so violently denounced by the prophets. It was on these cruelties that Edom was so violently denounced by the prophets, meaning condemned by the prophets. That's why you got Jake's out there trying so hard to save him, make him the Arabs, Make them the white man, make them the Smurfs, make them the Care Bears. Well, they try their hardest. But they know he's denounced and condemned in the Bible. Go ahead. Edom is mentioned in the cuneiform inscriptions in the form Udumi. Three of its kings are known from the same source. That's all I want. That's all I want. Cuneiform so, is Babylonian, yeah, Babylonian. La language. Right. That's their writings. Right. Go to um, Acts 13. No, read on to Conquest. Read on, read on. Down, down to Romans. Read on down. Go back down to where you at before, to the bottom of the 41, and read where you're at. Uh, to um, after the conquest, mm -hmm. right there. After the conquest of Judah by the Babylonians, the Edomites were allowed to settle in southern Palestine. Uh -huh. At the same time, they were driven by the Nabataeans from Idumea. Not entirely. Go ahead. In southern Palestine, they prospered for more than four centuries. Uh -huh. Judas Maccabeus conquered their territory for a time. Read that earlier. Go ahead. They were again subdued by John Hycranus. You keep reading the history over and over again. It's called, what I'm doing is called cross-referencing. Giving you different sources. Go ahead. By whom they were forced to observe Jewish rites and laws. By whom they were forced to observe Jewish rites and laws. And that's how you got, we'll get that later. Go ahead. They were then incorporated with the Jewish nation, uh -huh. and their country was called by the Greeks and Romans Idumia. That's all I want. Now, let's get Acts 13 and 1 regarding the incorporation. Acts 13 1, real quick, Herod's descendants. Acts 13 1. Hope you all see paying attention and yours focus, you understand? Because what, what Deacon Eitan is bringing out to you all is he's showing you all where these Jewish people come from, man. John Hycranius, he forced them to convert mm -hmm. to our customs. I just want to say something real quick. And if you got uh, Israelites out there that's saying that we are afraid to speak on Esau and all that, that which is absolutely stupid. When you're going into the records like they say, you're tearing this behind up. Not running around with a gun talking about taking down this man that's a damn military genius and, and, and blessed with all kinds of weaponry. You ain't going to do nothing but become a statistic dead. You can't mess with this man on that level. Okay? Acts 13, verse 1. Acts 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger mm -hmm. and Lu Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. So Herod, the Tetrarch, they were brought up in what? The laws. They were brought up in the same school, the laws. Manan and him were brought together. Manan was his foster brother, it says. Herod's foster brother, Manan. They were brought together. So he was raised up in the law. Herod, the Tetrarch, was brought up in the law. 
26 verse 1, real quick. Let me just skim that if we can. Acts 26 verse 1, this is when, this is when um, Paul comes with Paul Agrippa. This is Agrippa, I believe, the second. I think. Acts 26 verse 1. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand and answered for himself. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of of the Jews. Go ahead. Because Paul was brought up on charges by the Jews for blasphemy. Go ahead. Especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. How is he an expert? Based upon what we just read earlier. John Icranus forced him to learn the laws and the rights. He's a descendant of the man who came out of that, Antipater, the Idumean, or the Edomite. Y'all follow? I started Herod's to learn in our laws based upon John Icranus' forceful conversion of them, taking over their land. Let's get Revelations 2 and 9. They're going to read about their kids now. Revelations 2 and 9 and 3 and 9. Remember Ezekiel about Esau's blasphemies. In Ezekiel 35 and 12. You know what I want. Revelation 2 verse 9. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews. Which say they are Jews. And are not. And they're not Jews like the Herod, like the Edomians. Go ahead. But are the synagogue of Satan. But they are the devil the Bible speaks of. That's right. It's clear. It's clear, obvious. Three and nine. Let's see if he changes his mind. Revelation three and nine. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. He calls them the devil again. Which say they are Jews. So and the devil which says he's a Jew. And are not, but do lie. Lie about being Jews. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. And to know that I have loved thee. You, know, said, you are the true Jews all along. And I only dealt with you. That I'm your God, not theirs. That's your Herod right there. Go to the next book. Who is Esau? Esau? Who is Esau Edom? By Charles A. Wiseman. Mm -hmm. This book here. Some bones in it. But again, you take the good with the bad. I took a lot of good out of it, though. I found a lot of good in it, though. Mm -hmm. Who is Esau? We're going to go to page 7 and 8. I'll tell you when to stop. The Edomites were driven from Petra westward by the Nabathians in 312 B.C. That was in the dictionary. That was in the encyclopedia. Go ahead. And before the middle of the second century B.C., they were occupying not only southern Judah, but also Hebron and the country to its north as far as Bethzor. First Maccabees 429, 565. He's quoting the encyclopedia I have right here on the desk. You go to the bottom. Go to the bottom of the page real fast. See the bottom? Volume 5, Jewish Encyclopedia, page 41. We just read that earlier. He's citing from there. That's why I put those out first. I have the sources he has. Go back up. Read on. Nabathians now. The Nabathians now occupied Mount Seir, and the Edomites were driven into the old territory of Judah. So the Nabathians occupy a lot of Edomites' land. Those, that forced the Edomites to move into our land. So the Nabathians forced some of the Edomites out of the parts, portions of their land, and some of those Edomites were ended up migrating into our area of Judah, Hebron and so forth, the further south. Go ahead. The Maccabean family, a remnant of the true Judites, had ruled Judea. Wait, 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 read it again. The Maccabean family, a remnant of the true Judites. Remnant of the true Judites. True ones. Go ahead. Had ruled Judea from 166 to 37 B.C. And under Judas Maccabee, 1 Maccabee 5.3, recaptured the city of Hebron, from the Edomites in 164 B.C. We read that earlier. Go ahead. During the time of John Hycranus, 135, 105 B.C., the nephew of Judas, the Judites, were again faced with the hostility of the Idumeans. Uh -huh. Hycranus confronted the Edomites, causing a, dis a decisive change in the relations between the two factions. Read. John Hycranus conquered the whole of Edom and undertook the forced conversion of its inhabitants to Judaism. Uh huh. Go ahead. Thenceforth, the Edomites became a section of the Jewish people. He ruled over us as king of Judea. Herod. Go ahead. That statement is in a lot of books. I've read that statement. Yeah. That right, what you read there in a lot of books, historical, very expensive, rare books. Yeah, I had the book. The book he's the book he's quoting from. I have also on this desk. Is the, mm -hmm. Go down the second one. It's the number two next to it, right? Number two, next to Jewish people. Go down. 
the Encyclopedia Judaica, Volume 6. That's Volume 6 of what I have. So we have that as well up here. So they can't say we're citing false sources. Go back up. Where you at? Read on. Thus, at this con um, juncture of time, the Edomites were then incorporated with the Jewish nation, and their country was called by the Greeks and Romans, Idumia. That earlier, go ahead. But the tide turned in favor of the Edomite faction when Julius Caesar made Antipater an Edomite, procurator of Judea in 47 B.C. See what happened? See what Rome did? Rome put Antipater over the, over the kingdom of Judah. He was the counselor. He became the ruler because the Romans and them were Edomites. They were looked out for each other. Go ahead. When Antipater was killed four years later, his son Herod gained power but was rejected by the Judites. We Her Herod shrewdly gained the support of Rome. See, he's a Roman affiliate. Go ahead. Part of that red dragon. Go ahead. With a Roman army at his heels, he returned to Palestine. And after a six-month siege, he captured Jerusalem and became king of Judea in 37 B.C. By force. Go ahead. By the sword. Go ahead. Page 8. Go to the top. Right there. Herod was a shrewd and unscrupulous tyrant. He was evil as hell. And was despised by the Judites. Thou art greatly, thou art greatly despised. Obadiah. Go ahead. Because he was an Idumean and not one of their own stock. Because he was what? Because he was an Idumean and not one of their own stock. He didn't like them. And we like them ruling over us either. Go ahead. Herod hated the people of Judah. And he hated us too. It was mutual. Go ahead. Herod hated the people of Judah, and one of his first acts was to execute 45 of the leaders of the old uh, arist aristocracy. Aristoc aristocracy. Aristoc aristocracy to eliminate any rivalry for leadership. So he killed our, our people to maintain his rulership. Having, Go ahead. Having secured the kingship, Herod next destroyed the priestly line of Hycranus. See what he did? And he killed the line, the remnants of the, of the lineage. Go ahead. The last being Antagonus, who taunted Herod with his Idumean origin. He made fun of him. We didn't like him. Go ahead. And asserted that the kingdom should fall on one of the royal family. Finally, he murdered Aristobulus, the last of the Aaronic high priests. Dang. Herod then sought to affiliate himself with the high priesthood through marrying Merame, Aristobulus' sister and the daughter of a high priest. Then eventually he kills her and their kids together. Mm -hmm. Eventually. To, to, to keep the rule for himself. So her kids wouldn't take over. Even the Edomites too. But he killed all of them. He killed her as well. Can I say something? Yeah. When he says that um, you're the high cranius, the, the, the lineage, the high priest lineage, right? All of that was Judah, Maccabees, and them lineage. You, under, you all understand? So what they was doing, they was killing out anybody that, that going to be in a position to them, to him. That's what he was doing. He was killing out that whole priestly lineage, any, any kingly lineage. He was killing out all, anybody that going, going to be in a opposition to him. And that's how the white man rolled. Read the next part right here. Just read the um, temple. Herod even rebuilt the temple as it was in ruins from repeated sieges, uh -huh. part of which Herod was responsible for by his attack upon the city. He destroyed the temple too as part of it. Go ahead. The temple of God became, in a sense, Herod's temple. And he built an outer court for the, for the Gentiles to dwell in, and that's the one they be well into, up and up and down. That's what they built to, that part that Herod built. We thus find that in the years just before the time of Christ, Judea was controlled by an Edomite faction who usurped the Judite name. Who call themselves Jews and are not. Go ahead. Land and heritage. Land and what? And heritage. Our land and our heritage. It took... Go ahead. Under Hycranus, the Edomites were forced to be part of Judean culture. But under Herod, the Herodian faction had control over the Judeans' culture and way of life. Herod took over our culture and gave us his. Edomite culture. Rome. Go ahead. Confounding the matter is the fact that some Judites had intermixed with Edomite, Canaanite, and other alien stock at the time they returned from the Babylonian captivity. That's true. That's all you want. That's all you want. Let's not take it somewhere else. Now let's go to the new Westminster Dictionary. The new Westminster Dictionary I have here. The new Westminster. Is that what I want? I'm sure that's what I want. Uh, yeah. The new Westminster Dictionary. That's this again. I want page 379. Herod, offspring of a hero. 
Offspring of a hero. The word hero means hero. Okay, all right. I had to pause on that for a minute. Yeah, hero. Offspring of a hero. The name of several rulers over Palestine. Name of several rulers over Palestine. Go ahead. And the adjacent regions or portions of them. Uh -huh. Three are mentioned in the in the New Testament by the name of Herod and one by the name of Agrippa. Acts 26. Go ahead. Herod the Great. He was the second son of, of the Idumean Antipas or Antipater by his wife Cyprus who was of the same race. They say she was a Betian or Edom. I say Edom. But go ahead. Thus... Neither by the father's nor by the mother's side was Herod a real Jew. Read it again. Thus, neither by the father's nor by the mother's side was Herod a real Jew. Go ahead. Though the Idumeans who had been conquered by John Hycranus and compelled to be circumcised and adopt Judaism. What, what happened? Go ahead. And adopt Judaism had now become nominal, nominally Jews. What does nominal mean? Go to nominal, please. I sent you that link. They have become nominal or nominally Jews. What does nominal mean? Hmm. Well, we call them all the time. Nominal, of role or status, existing in name only. Go to more. Titular, formal, official, theoretical, supposed, ostensible, so-called. So-called. In name only, not nationality. In name also, they call themselves Israelis. They're not Israelites, they're Israelis. Inhabitants of the land, not descendants of the man. So it's not a mistake that they call themselves Jewish. Right, mm -hmm. it's not a mistake. Okay, you just thought that they just said that just out of just thin air. They know the reason why they're saying that they are pertaining to what they are not, actually. Right. That's what ish means, I-S-H, means pertaining to. And on that note, Psalm 64, verse 8. Psalm 64 and verse 8. I got time. I got time. 64, verse 8. I'm doing good. Yeah. You said 54? 64, verse 8. Psalm 64, verse 8. We use this all the time. And we're reading it all the time right now in the class. Psalm 64, verse 8. Uh -huh. So they shall make their own tongue to fall upon themselves. All that see them shall flee away. Read again. So they shall make their own tongue to fall upon themselves. I mean, they're going to tell on themselves that they're not who they say they are. As Christ said in Revelation 2 and 9, 3 and 9, you're not who you say you are. You're the devil the Bible speaks of. And your own books tell on you. This is their books I'm reading out of. Jewel's Encyclopedia. This is their books. This is their sources, not mine. I didn't make this up. I didn't write this book. This is their sources I'm using. They write these books to themselves so that they'll know how to keep themselves together. Right. The problem is, is that when we get them, then they start sending the prices through the roof. Yep. Get Deuteronomy 33 and 29. Not fact, no, no, no. Go to Wikipedia. Go to Kazars. Go to Kazars. We'll just start with that. Wikipedia, Kazars, and Wikipedia, for, for, for the record, cites all these books I have on the desk here. They say Wikipedia is not to be used or trusted in. If it cites correct sources, I'm going to use it. I'm not listening to what apologetics be saying about Wikipedia. The hell with you, you devils the Bible speaks of. The Kazars, well, go ahead and read it. Um, mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I'm going to get to the point. Just read uh, for, some three for some three centuries, read that part, the Kazars. For some three centuries, 60... 650 to 965, the Khazars dominated the vast area extended from the Volga Don steeps to the eastern Crimea and the northern Caucasus. So they resided in the Caucasus mountains. Go down a little bit. Slowly, slowly. Khazarian mm -hmm. cognate. That means their Khan or their leader, their chief. Mm -hmm. They're called Kagans uh, or Khans. Go ahead. Or Kagans. Go down a little bit. Right there, see the map where it, where it is, where Kazaria was? Capital, Balanjar, we're gonna find, keep that in mind, Balanjar, Samandar. Keep those words in mind, we're gonna read those in the encyclopedia that they gave us to read. Go down. Attil, keep that in mind, go on, go, on, go up, slow down, slow down, slow down. Attil is their capital. Religion is Tengrism, Buddhism, Judaism, became their religion eventually. Christianity, Islam, because you had different groups of Khazars. You had people called Bulgars, Magyars, Khazars. The word Bulgarian comes from Bulgar. 
and they're all dwelt and they're called Slavic peoples. That's European. Slavic peoples. Macedonia falls in that category. Macedonian, Slavic, same thing. Um, Balkans, that same area, that's all the same. It's all the same people. It says, it says um, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, paganism, and religious syncretism means all they mixed around, all the above. They mix it all together, like a melting pot of religions. That's them. Khazar, Cognate. There's the first, it says um, Quag, um, Quagan, Cajun, Tang Yabu, 9th century, we're going to deal with. Balan, Obadiah, keep these names in mind. Balan, Ob see how the names changed? Mm -hmm. From a, a pagan to, he to Hebrew. Balan, Obadiah, Zechariah, Manasseh, Benjamin, Aaron. That's not their names. Uh, Manasseh, Benjamin, Aaron, Joseph, David. Middle Ages, that's the time frame. Middle Ages, Dark Ages. Dis disestablished, 969, by the Russians. Edomite Russians to were pagans, took over, conquered their land, and took it over. And they rule now Russia, Kiev, that area. Uh, go down some more. Yarmouk, go down. Turkic, go down, go down. Bulgaria, see old great Bulgaria, it's all the same people. Go down. It's the Persian Empire, then jump down to the bottom. Khazaria long served as a buffer state between the Byzantine Empire and both the nomads of the northern steeps and the um Umayyad Caliphate. Caliphate. So what happened was you had the Byzantine Empire was one rulership, and you had the Khazars in the middle, and you had the is Ishmael, Ishmaelites, Arabs, Umayyad, Umayyad Caliphate were fighting for power. The Khazars are neutral. They were powerful as hell too. So they couldn't get, they, they had to get through Khazarians to fight each other. So they were trying to force, well, both of them were trying to force the Khazars to convert to either Christianity, which some of them did, or to Islam, which some of them did. But most of them converted to Judaism. That's why I said they were a buffer state between the two, a buffer state between pagan Israelite Romans and you had uh, Ishmaelites. All right? So jump down to between 965. Between 965 and 969, uh -huh. the Kievan Rus. The Kievan Rus is the ancient Russians. Kievan, that's you have a place called Kiev. Kiev Rus is short for Russia. Ruler Sviat, Sviatoslav, Sviatoslav. Go ahead. Ruler Sviatoslav the first of Kiev conquered the capital Attil and destroyed the Khazar state. And they overthrew it and took it over. Now jump down. Hold on, slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down. Uh, go down some more. Right there, read, read proposals. Proposals of Khazar origins have been made regarding the Slavic Judaizing Sabbatniks. Right, Jewish Sabbath, Sabbath observers. I'm elect Sabbath observers, go ahead. The Bukharan Jews, the Muslim Kumyaks, Kum Kum whatever, yeah, whatever. Kazakhs, Kazakhs. The Cossacks of the Don region. Stop. The Cossacks in their own constitution tell you that they were Khazars, and they established Russia today. They're the, origina they're, the, they're the originators of Russia, of what Russia is now. The Cossacks started that, of the Don region. They acknowledge in their own constitution that, that they were Khazars. They don't even argue it. Go ahead. The Turkic-speaking Krimchaks and their Crimean neighbors, the Karaites, to the Moldovian Snagos, the Mountain Jews, and others. In the late 19th century, a theory emerged that the core of today's Ashkenazi Jews... Notice it says the core. The core. The core means the primary group, them in particular. The core of today's Ashkenazi Jews or German Jews, really. Go ahead. Nucleus. Right, oh. the nucleus. Thank you. The nucleus of them. Go ahead. Are genetically descended... From a hypothetical Khazarian Jewish diaspora. Oh, he's so hypothetical. No, it's not hypothetical. It's actual Khazarian Jewish. Go ahead. Who had migrated westward from modern Russia and Ukraine into modern France and Germany. So they migrated. They were Khazarian diaspora because when the Russians came in and conquered them, they scattered into areas of Germany and they ran to areas of Russia and uh, France. Go ahead. This theory still finds occasional support. Stop. That's how it's not a theory anymore. It still finds occasional support, meaning it finds facts that it's true. Go ahead. But most scholars view it with skepticism. Meaning they don't want you to know. That's what that means. Go ahead. The theory is sometimes associated with anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism. To scare you away from the facts. Trigger words. Trigger words. You're hate. You're a racist. You're full of hate. That's what that is. Those are defense walls built up right there. Jump down. Uh, right there, go down. Khazar theories. Read that whole thing. So Ashkenazi Khazar theories. Ashkenazi Khazar theories. 
Go ahead. Several scholars have suggested that the Khazars did not disappear after dissolution of their empire. By the Russians, by the Kiev Rus. Go ahead. But migrated west to eventually form part of the core of the later Ashkenazi Jewish population of Europe. Go ahead. This hypothesis is greeted with skepticism or caution by most scholars. Because they don't want you to know it's true. That's why it's cautioned. Go ahead. The German Orientalist Karl Newman, in the context of an earlier controversy about possible connections between Khazars and the ancestors of the Slavic peoples, suggested as early as 1847. So he, he brought this out as early as the year 1847, before they even established the state. These guys, those are Khazars. Go ahead. Suggested as early as 1847, immigrant Khazars might have influenced the core population of Eastern European Jews. He's saying it's most likely that the Khazars make up most of the Eastern European Jews. We don't watch. Go the, keep going. The theory was then taken up by Abraham Eliyahu Harkavi. See that name in mind. That name is, is written numerous times. It's spelled with a Y, though. Harkavi is spelled with a Y, usually. It's A. Harkavi. Read it. Go ahead. In 1869. A few years later. When he also claimed a possible link between the Khazars and Ashkenazi. But the theory that Khazar converts formed a major proportion of Ashkenazi was first proposed to Western public in a lecture in this by, side of the world. Go ahead. by Ernest R R Renan in 1883. Later Occasional again. suggestions emerged that there was a small Khazar. Bring it up, bring it up. Come on, come on. Occasional suggestions emerged that there was a small Khazar component in East European Jews in works by Joseph Jacobs, 1886, uh -huh. Anatole Leroy Boileau, a critic of anti-Semitism, 1893. A critic of anti-Semitism. He's acknowledging it. Go ahead. Maximilian Ernest Gumplowitz, and by the, Ru the Russian Jewish anthropologist Samuel Weisenberg. The Russian Jewish anthropologist, the study of racists, came to understand that. Go ahead. In 1909, Hugo von Kus Kuskera developed the notion into a book-length study, arguing Khazars formed the foundational core of the modern Ashkenazi. Some of them are mixed with Arab. That's why he's saying that. But there, most of them is Edom, is Khazar. Go ahead. Maurice Fishberg introduced the notion to American audiences in 1911. The idea was also taken up by the Polish Jewish economic historian and general Zionist Yitzhak Shipper. In uh, uh, Zionist says it's true. 1918. Go ahead. Scholarly anthropologists such as Roland B. Dixon, 1923, and writers like H.G. Wells. Keep that name in mind. I had that book also. H.G. Wells. I had that book here. Go ahead. 1921 used it to argue that the main part of Jewry never was in Judea. The main part of the Jews today were never in Judea. A Go thesis ahead. that was to have a political echo in later opinion. That thing never changed. It echoed into other people's ears. Go ahead. In 1932, Samuel Cross ventured the theory that the biblical Ashkenaz referred to Northern Asia Minor and identified it with the Khazars, a position immediately disputed by Jacob Mann. Because occasionally you have Edomites who are smart. Well, listen, listen, stop bringing that up. They had, to, they had to fight each other. Listen, stop that. Because some of these don't care. You know, with Khazars, who cares? They don't realize the repercussions of what they're saying. So other Edomites will come along and go, hey, stop saying that stuff. Before the real Jews the real wake Jews up. Wake That's up. what he's right. pointing. That's what he's saying. Listen, remember, this is early 1900s. We were still asleep, fighting for rights and so forth. So they were like, listen, stop saying this stuff before they wake up. So you had most of them saying, hey, we're Khazars. Yeah, yeah, most of us is just Khazars. And some saying, hey, 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 stop saying that. That's not true. Trying to do damage control. That's what you're reading here, back and forth. But most of you are saying it's true. Go ahead. Ten years later, 1942, Abraham N. Polak, sometimes referred to as Poliak, later professor for the history of the Middle Ages at Tel Aviv University, Tel Aviv University, published a Hebrew monograph in which he concluded that the East European Jews came from Khazaria. D.M. Dunlop, writing in 1954, thought very little evidence backed what he regarded as a mere assumption and argued that the Ashkenazi Khazar descent theory went far beyond what our imperfect records permit. Damage control. Go ahead. Leon Polyakov, while assuming the Jews of Western Europe resulted from a panmixia in the last millennium, asserted in 1955 that it was widely assumed that Europe's Eastern Jews descended from a mix of Khazarian and German Jews. Right, Poliak's ahead. work found some support in Salo, Whitmire, Barron, and Ben Zion. Found support. People say, oh, he's right, he's right. With two other scholars, go ahead. And Ben Zion Dinar, but was dismissed by Bernard Weinrib as a fiction in 1962. Exactly. Bernard ahead. Lewis is of the opinion that the word in, in Cairo Geniza interpreted as Khazaria is actually Hakari, and therefore it relates to the Kurds of 
the Hakkari Mountains in southeast Turkey. Damage control, also Syrians, not Edomites. The Khazar Ashkenazi hypothesis came to the attention of much wider public with the publication of Arthur Kosler's The 13th Tribe in 1976. Yeah, but to wider public, that's what it got worse. He made it worse. Go ahead. Which was both positively reviewed and dismissed as a fantasy and a somewhat dangerous one. Because he bought all the facts. Go ahead. Israel's ambassador to Britain branded it an anti-Semitic action financed by the Palestinians. The Arabs, the Arabs helped him. Then they had him killed. While Bernard Lewis claimed that the idea was not supported by any evidence whatsoever and had been abandoned by all serious scholars. That's a lie. We've been all the scholars earlier. That's a lie. Go Raphael ahead. Pattaya, however, registered some support for the idea that Khazar remnants had played a role in the growth of Eastern European Jewish communities. So it got played off and it came back again. Go ahead. And several amateur researchers, such as Boris Atchler, 1994, and Kevin Allen Brook kept the thesis in the public eye. The theory had been occasionally manipulated to deny Jewish nationhood. Go ahead. Recently, a variety of approaches from linguistics, Paul Wexler, to hi historiography, Shlomo San. He wrote the book called The Invention of the Jew. And population genetics, Aaron al -Hayat. Aaron Hayek went to the tombstones and did DNA research and found that the Ashkenazis today are the exact descendants of Khazars through genetics. Aaron al Hayek, mm -hmm. a geneticist from University of Sheffield. He went through the tombstones, found the remains, and said these guys match up with the Germans. The same people. <laughs> Telling themselves. Go ahead. And Aaron L. Hike, a geneticist from the University of Sheffield, have emerged to keep the theory alive. Because he bought facts, so it's alive. Go ahead. In broad academic perspective, both the idea that the Khazars converted in mass to Judaism and the suggestion they, Im they immigrated to form the core population of Ashkenazi Jewry remain highly... Polemical, polemical, polemical issues. Highly debated issues, meaning it's in debates. No debates, it's facts. Now, let's get. Um, that's why he wrote. In, yeah. That's why he wrote in that book. Uh, Arthur Kosler, one of the reviewers that reviewed the book, he said, "The the true answer, the the startling discovery of the of the true ancestry of." of the uh, ancestry of the Jews, meaning the people that you call Jews. Mm -hmm. He said it will cause a stir. Yep. That's what he put. He said that the, the startling rediscovery of the people that you call Jews. If you really dig deep into it, it will cause a stir. Mm. Deuteronomy, 30, Deuteronomy 33, verse 29. Deuteronomy 33 and 29. Deuteronomy 33, verse 29. Uh, Happy okay. art thou, O Israel, who is like unto thee, O people saved by the Lord. The shield of thy help, and who is the sword of thy excellency? And thine enemies shall be found liars unto thee. Our enemies shall be found liars unto us. Lying about who they are, lying about who we are. Found liars. Go ahead. And thou shalt tread upon their high places. We're going to conquer them and overthrow them when this time comes. Let's get um, Jewish Encyclopedia, volume four. Remember the names? Harkavi, um, Attil. Samander, the capitals, I mean, just, just keep those in mind. If you ain't paying attention, you're going to fall behind. I'm not going back over it again. Khazars, read that. Khazars, a people of Turkish origin whose life and history are interwoven with the very beginnings of the history of the Jews of Russia. Stop. Read it again, please. A people of Turkish origin whose life and history are interwoven, interwoven, with, interwoven with the very Beginnings of the history of the Jews of Russia. So the Jews of Russia, their history begins with the Khazars. This is in their books. Where's the theory at? Where's the theory? It's the first sentence in the book. Our people don't realize what you represent. You got these scholars going all over the earth fighting and, and battling each other, trying to discredit one another. All of this is because the most dangerous thing that can happen is the so-called Negroes finding out that they're the people of God, the, the Negroes and Hispanics. Y'all really don't realize how much work has been done to keep us asleep. You really don't know. You, even, even though we're sitting here now, you do testament, we, testament after testament, you still don't see it. You're going to see it one day. You're going to realize how, how, how important you are. Okay, you say, the okay. name, y'all notice it's saying Jewish Encyclopedia, who do the people that put this information together, who do they expect their readership to be? Negroes? <laughs> Hispanics? No. This is for them to know how to conduct themselves.
That's what it's about. The book was published in 1902. 1902. We were fighting for rights in the 60s. We won't even know anything about this at all. We won't look about this stuff here. Remember, during that time, we thought we were Jewish. We were following behind these people here. A lot of the Israelites of the old time were following what were supposed to be converts. Right. Ethiopian, right. Jews. We were following behind these bastards. And meanwhile, in their own books, they're saying that they're not the real Jews. In their own books. So we follow behind them in their falsehood. That's why I said they shall be found liars according to the law. Read, it was probably. It was probably about that time that the Kagan of the Khazars and his grandees, together with a large number of his heathen people, embraced the Jewish religion. Uh -huh. According to A. Harkavy. Remember that name? Abraham Harkavy. It was with an I in Wikipedia. Go ahead. The conversion took place in 620, according to others in 740. Whatever, it still happened regardless. Go ahead. King Joseph, in his letter Remember to... Remember Wikipedia mentioned it said, it said um, Bullen, it said uh, Ob Aaron, Obadiah. Manasseh, Obadiah, Joseph. It's the same names. Go ahead. King Joseph, in his letter to Hasdai... Hasdai. Hasdai. Ibn, Ibn Shapra. Ibn Shapra. He's a, just a Jew. Hasdai was a Jew. Um, he's a Hasdai, son of Shapra. Go ahead. <laughs> About 960 gives the following account of the conversion. So you had a, a correspondence between a Jew of status, I believe it was in Spain or somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. he, he reached out to King Joseph of the Khazars. He reached out to him. And he, he was trying to document the history of the Khazars. Okay, we'll, we'll just read it. Go ahead, I won't jump ahead. Go ahead. Some centuries ago, King Bullen reigned over the Khazars. To him, God appeared in a dream and promised him might and glory. Encouraged by this dream, Bullen went by the road of Darlin to the country of Ardabil, where he gained great victories over the Arabs. Uh-huh, because Ishmael was fighting to take that land over. The Byzantine emperor... That's why on the culture's book, the Arabs gave an account how these guys were hard to convert. They were filthy, wore clothes so they disintegrated off of them. They would eat lice out each other's hair and crunch it in They're their laughing teeth. and say it was delicious. And, and, right, and that's men and the women. The men, yeah. Scarlett Johansson... Yeah, yeah, Molly Cyrus, yeah, that was them cage doing the same thing. Fur all over. Take, razor, take, take the blade from them, raise the blade from them. Give them a few months, see how they look. And they stink, too. Hey, Could you imagine hey, that? Hey, that's, Could you hey, imagine listen. What it like in them caves? Hey, that's where the theory of the caveman come right, from. Right, I'm going to get that later. Go ahead. The Byzantine emperor and the caliph of the Ishmaelites sent to him and the caliph of what? The Byzantine emperor and the caliph of the Ishmaelites. See, they didn't know? They know the caliph of the Ishmaelites. That's the Umayyad um, caliphate in Wikipedia. That's Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites sent to him. Read again. The Byzantine emperor and the caliph of the Ishmaelites sent to him envoys with presents and sages to convert him to their respective religions. Uh -huh. Bullen invited also wise men of Israel. He invited Israelites. Go ahead. And proceeded to examine them all as each of the champions believed his religion to be the best. Bullen separately questioned the Mohammedans Arabs and the Christians as, like Christians. Go ahead. as to which of the other two religions they considered the better. When both gave preference to that of the Jews, the Bible. that king perceived that it must be the true religion. Judaism is true. Christianity, hold on, because Christianity and Islam come from the Bible, so I'm going to follow what you guys follow. The Torah, go ahead. He therefore adopted it. See how KV Shishpanish. Right, right, right. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Yeah. This account of the conversion. This account of the conversion was considered to be of a legendary it's nature. It's fairy tale. Go ahead. Harkavy, however, proved from Arabic and Slavonian sources that the religious disputation at the Khazarian court is a historical fact. So they were trying to play it off, but Harkavy proved no. I'm, Arabs had documented it also. And their own people documented it also. So it's actual historical fact. It's no legend. It's historical fact. So it's not hypothesis. It's not theory. Our Hakavi brought it out. Go ahead. Even you, probably, the, you probably killed him too. Go ahead. Even the name of Sangari has been found in a liturgy of Constantine, the philosopher Cyril. It was one of the successors of Bullen named Obadiah. Ah, we read that name in Wikipedia too, Obadiah, go ahead. Who regenerated the kingdom and strengthened the Jewish religion. Go ahead. He invited Jewish scholars to settle in his dominions. He invited Israelites to settle within that land, and we did. Go ahead. And, but we, we were the minority, small group. Go ahead. And founded synagogues and schools. Where we taught them in, in their land. It was just like we did at John Icranus. Same thing happening again. Go ahead. The people were instructed in the Bible. Mishnah, Words of the Bible, and Talmud, Babylonian, pagan nonsense, 
and in the divine service of the Hazanim. I don't know what that is. Go ahead. In their writings, the Khazars used the Hebrews, the Hebrew letters. Go ahead. Obadiah. Obadiah was succeeded by his son Hezekiah. Uh-huh. The latter by his son Manasseh. That's Manasseh in by Hanukkah. That's in Wikipedia. A brother of Obadiah, Hanukkah by his son Isaac. Uh-huh. Isaac by. Go up. Isaac by his son Moses or Manasseh II. Uh-huh. The latter by his son Nisi and Nisi by his son Aaron II. Wikipedia mentions all that list of kings. Remember that in Wikipedia? The list of all the kings Obadiah, Manasseh, Aaron, Joseph, Bullen, Benjamin. It's all there. So Wikipedia is citing its correct sources. Go ahead. King Joseph himself was a son of Aaron and ascended the throne in accordance with the law of the Khazars relating to succession. On the whole, King Joseph's account agrees generally with the evidence given by the Arabic writers of the 10th century. It's back. Go ahead. But in detail, it contains a few discrepancies. Meaning it, it contains falsehoods. Because they, 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 Esau did was, Esau made up a letter that Joseph wrote in response to Hasdai regarding their, um, their nationality. They're saying, now nah, there's some error in that. It didn't make no sense. Because they were trying to do damage control once again. I'm going to show you the damage control. Keep going. According to Infadlon. I'm going to show you. I'm sorry. I'm gonna, I'm sorry. I'm going to show you why they made fake letters from King Joseph back to Hasdai with discrepancies. I'm going to show you why. Go ahead. According to, to In Fadlin, In Dasta, and others, only the king and the grandees were followers of Judaism. Go ahead. The rest of the Khazars were Christians, Mohammedans, and heathens, and the Jews were in a great minority. Go ahead. According to Masudi, the king and the Khazars proper were Jews. Uh-huh. But the army consisted of Mohammedans, while the other Inhabitants, especially the Slavonians and Russians, were heathens. And Russians. See Come them on, among, brothers. Among the same people. Slavonians and Russians among them were heathens. I mean, they were the pagan. They didn't deal with anything. Go ahead. From the work Kitab al-Buldan, written about the 9th century, it appears as if all the Khazars were Jews and that they had been converted to Judaism only a short time before that book was written. Uh-huh. But this work was probably inspired by Jayahani, and it may be assumed that in the ninth century, many Khazar heathens became Jews, owing to the religious zeal of King Obadiah. So King Obadiah enforced the Judaism on them. Many, it, was, it, was like, it was like wishy-washy at first, and King many, Obadiah enforced it. Many Khazar heathens became Jews. Uh-huh. Became Jews, yeah. Such a conversion in great masses, say Closen, uh-huh. may have been the reason for the embassy of Christians from the land of Khazars to the Byzantine Emperor Michael. Uh-huh. The report of the embassy reads as follows. Come, no, come down, jump down, jump down. The history, of the, the history of the kingdom of the Khazars undoubtedly pre- presents one of the most remarkable features of the Middle Ages. Uh-huh. Surrounded by wild nomadic peoples and themselves leading Partly a nomadic life. They wander, a wanderers. The Khazars enjoyed all the privileges of civilized nations, Uh a well-constituted and tolerant government, a flourishing trade, and a well-disciplined standing army. They dealt with flourishing trade. Keep that in mind. They dealt with flourishing trade, trade, trade. Remember, they had the Byzantine on one side, Ishmael on the other side. So they would do a trade of both of them. Go ahead. In a time when fanaticism, ignorance, and, and, and anarchy reigned in Western Europe, the kingdom of the Khazars could boast of its just and broad-minded administration and all. Go ahead. Next page. Page three. I'm going to get to his letter. Has died. Now, I'm going to go to his letter now. Taking not fact, yeah, read the Jewish population. The Jewish population in the entire domain of the Khazars in the period between the 7th and 10th centuries must have been considerable. There is no doubt that the Caucasian and other Oriental Jews had lived and carried on business with the Khazars long before the arrival of the Jewish fugitives from Greece, who escaped, 723, from the, from the mania for conversion which possessed the, Byz- the Byzantine emperor Leo the Assyrian. Right, some of us fled from the Byzantine Empire into the areas of Europe, further into Europe, and among the Khazars, the Khazars are neutral. So wherever the Byzantines had no power, we fled there, where they had no power. We dwelt there among the, Edom, among the um, Khazars. Go ahead. From the correspondence between King Joseph and Hasdai, Here we go. it is apparent that the two Spanish Jews, Judah ben Mir ben Nathan and Joseph Cagaris, had succeeded in settling in the land of the Khazars, right. and that it was a German Jew, Isaac ben Eleazar, from the land of Nymetes, Na- Na- Germany, who carried Hasdai's letter to the king Sadia. Sadia, who had a fair knowledge of the kingdom of the Khazars. So this guy had, uh, says that, had carried a, has a letter to the king Sadia, who had a fair knowledge. So Hasdai 
was in contact with a guy named Sa'adja who had a fair knowledge of the kingdom of the Khazars. Go ahead. Mentions a certain Isaac ben Abraham who had removed from Surah to Khazaria, Harkavi and Kalut Memorial Volume, page 244, uh -huh. among. among the various routes enumerated by the Arabic geographer in Kard Kard right, right, right. Kardaba as being, used. as being used by the Radaniate Jewish merchants. There is one leading from Spain or France via Alemania uh -huh. through the land of the Slavonians close by Atel. Atel, that's in the book of Peter also, Atel was their capital. Go ahead. Close by Atel, the capital of the Khazars. Uh -huh. Once they crossed the sea of the Khazars, Caspian, Caspian sea, sea, and continued their voyage via Belk, Trans, Transoxnia, and continued their voyage via and the land of, of Tagaska to India and China. Right, so stop. So the point is this. These guys... Hasdai was a Jew. He was in contact with other Jews who did travel and, and resided in Khazar, Khazaria. And Hasdai had an interest in the Khazars and their history and how they came into being, came into power. He had an interest in them. Read Hasdai right there. Hasdai Ibn Hasdai Ibn Shapur, who is foreign minister to Abd al Rahman, Sultan of Cordova. So he was a foreign minister. So he had status and he had wisdom in this area. Sultans, what? E uh, Elam? Sultans? Sultan is. I think it's Ishmael or Elam. It's Turkish. Or tur whatever. That's he, Turkish. Sultan right. He had, a, he had a um, status yeah. among these people. Go ahead. Sultan of Cordova, in his letter to King Joseph of the Khazars about 960, relates that the first information about that kingdom was communicated to him by envoys from Khor Khorasan. So he got understanding of the Khazars' origins from people of Khorasan. Go ahead. And that their statements were corroborated. And their statements were proven substantially. Go ahead. By the by the ambassadors from Byzantium. By Byzantine emperors who also say, okay, you're right. Yeah, they come from this place and that place. Go ahead. The latter told him that the powerful Khazars were maintaining amicable, amicable relations with the B Byzantine Empire, with which they carried on by sea a trade in fish, skins, and other wares, the voyage from Constantinople occupying 15 days. Stop. So he, so he wants to understand from the, hear, hear from the horse's mouth, okay, these things I'm hearing about you guys, is it true? So we're going to read his letter. That, that a Jew transferred from him to um, King Joseph. Go to the other side. Let's see what he asked them regarding the information he got from the Byzantines regarding their, their, their history and from other envoys. The Taking a keen interest. You want that? Taking a keen interest in everything relating to the kingdom of the Khazars, Hasdai begs the king to communicate to him a detailed account of the geography of his country. Right. Tell me about your country. Go ahead. So of, you write it down. Go of ahead. its internal constitution, of the customs and occupations of its inhabitants, and especially of the history of the ancestry of and of the state. Stop. He wants to know the ancestry and of the state. The king's ancestry and the people's ancestry. Watch what he says. In this letter, Hazai speaks of the tradition according to which the Khazars once dwelt near the Sierra Mountains. Stop. They once dwelt near where? Sierra Mountains, according to tradition. Where do you get it from? The Byzantines and the envoys that dealt with them in business and trade with silk and fur and boats and so forth. He said, you guys, I hear you guys are from the Sierra Mountains. Now, remember Ezekiel 35 and 6 calls Esau, Sierra. Remember that? So if these people resided in the Sierra Mountains and migrated to Caucasus Mountains, then the cave dwellers or Europeans would be uh, Edomites. Edomites. Hmm. Now this is out of the history books. So when you got the S S J James Esau trying to say that he's not Esau, the scholars say something different. Read the rest. Read the rest. <laughs> I, I mentioned y'all earlier about the Demis control. Read the rest. He refers to the narrative of Eldad Haidani. Stop. Eldad Haidani is referring to Eldad the Danite, a mythical story of how Simeon um, resided in, um, in, in that area, Turkey, and the northern kingdom went over there. But watch what it says after that. Who's not going to refute the Sierra Mountains part. Watch what it does here. Watch. Who thought he had discovered the lost ten tribes. Uh-huh. Watch and this. And inquires whether the Khazars know anything concerning the end of the miracles, the coming of the Messiah. Right. As to Eldad Hyde Denai. As to his account of the Northern Kingdom being over there. Go ahead. Unauthenticated account. No, it's, uh, it's, it's unauthenticated account of the lost ten tribes. There's no evidence supporting it. But it's not saying that the Sierra Mountains parts are unauthenticated. It ain't arguing that. 
The 10 Dust Tribes thing, nah, that's not, there's no evidence to, to, to support that. But the Sierra Mountains thing is supported. That's why it's not argued here. That's why what they did was they created a fake letter from King Joseph back to Hasdai saying, you are from Japheth. And I'm going to show you later, I'm going to show you on the same thing that they say that's a lie also. Um, that's all I want. Jump to page four, please. I have two lines next to them. Go to page four. Watch. Someone, someone wrote a letter from King Joseph responding to the inquiry of, mm -hmm. are you from the Sierra Mountains? He goes, nah, we're from Japheth. I'm from Togarma. Blah, blah, blah. And lies. Nonsense. Right there. Stop that line right there. Blow it up. The Russian academician, friend and Swedish scholar, D. Hosen collected and published in the first quarter of the 19th century. All the Arabic testimony on the subject of the Khazars known at the time. The Arabs documented their correspondence between them and the Khazars and has died letter as well. Go ahead. The authenticity of the letter of King Joseph has, however, since been fully established by the very material which those scholars had at their disposal. Go ahead. Watch this. F Fran acknowledges the genuineness of Hasdai's letter. He acknowledges the genuineness of Hasdai's letter. You guys are Sierra Mountains. He acknowledges that. Go ahead. But not that of King Joseph. Not that of King Joseph's response to them being Japheth. There's discrepancies in that. We read that earlier. Go ahead. In the same way, D. Hassan, although he found the information of the Arabic and Byzantine writers in conformity with the contents of the Khazar letters, could not help doubting its genuineness. Because it's fake. Go ahead, trying to cover up their tracks. Go ahead. This may be explained by the fact that as they did not understand Hebrew, they did not care to commit themselves on a question which lay outside of their field of investigation. Go ahead. But the Jewish scholars... They're not going to answer, they're not gonna answer to what they don't know. Go ahead. But the Jewish scholars had no doubts, whatever, as to the genuineness of the Khazarian documents, especially since the beginning of the critical school of Rap Rappaport and Zuns, they were made use of by many writers in Spain in the 12th century. As for instance, by Judah Ha Levi, 1140, who displayed a close acquaintance with the contents of King Joseph's epistle, and by the historian Abraham Ibn Ibn Dude of Toledo, 1160, who distinctly refers to the same letter. Go ahead. Later on, with the, the persecutions which ended with the expulsion of the Jews from Spain. Spanish Inquisition, go ahead. The Khazarian documents, together with many other treasurers of medieval Jewish literature, were lost to the learned and were not recovered until the end of the 16th century when they were found in Egypt by Isaac Akrish. Go ahead. The Jews of that time took little interest. However, in the history of the past being absorbed by the cheerless events of their own epoch, Keep going. the first re reference... Therefore, to the Khazar letters is by Rabbi Bacharach of Worms in 1679, who discovered proofs of the, genuine, the genuineness of Hasdai's letter. So they found proof of Hasdai's letter being factual. Jump down, the uh, um, acrostic. The, this acro acrostic, however, again remained unnoticed until it was rediscovered by Frensdorf, independently of Bacharach, in 1836. Four years. Four years later, 1840, the genuineness of Hasdai's letter was absolutely... Go ahead, keep going. Watch, go up. Watch it says absolutely what? Was absolutely proved by Joseph Zedner. Keep going. He also acknowledged the authenticity of the Kagan's letter, but did not submit proofs. Because there is no proof. So the, the, the authenticity of Hasdai's letter, them being a sea of mountains, authentic. The response that, jo uh, that Joseph gave to... Has die is false. No proof behind it. Unauthentic. Y'all follow what I'm saying? That was damage control. That was shunned by their own people. It was damage control was removed. Dismissed. So they came from the Sierra Mountains. Now, let's go to um, Jewish Diaspora, Volume 3. You often wonder why the so-called Jews use the Talmud over time. The Talmud. Mm -hmm. You ever the Talmud before? Oh, Lord. The Talmud. They have Babylonian months for their years and all mm -hmm. that. You ever wonder why they use the Talmud? We're going to find out tonight. Early Jewish history of the Caucasus. The early history of the Jewish communities of the Caucasus is quite controversial and scattered among numerous historical sources in the oral traditions of the Georgian, Mountain, and Bukharian Jews. Historical sources link the arrival of Jews to the Caucasus in Central Asia with the exile of the Ten Tribes, 720 BCE, or with the destruction of the First Temple, 586 so it's BCE. one or the other. They, 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 they say that some of the Jews from both exiles ran over there, whatever. Jump down to... Like I said, the Israelites are over there in minority. 
Where is that? The bottom paragraph. Jews began to okay, settle on the shores. Jews began to settle on the shores of the Black Sea and in the Caucasian mountains as a result of the persecution of the Jews in Byzantium and the ensuing exodus. Especially so, so you had Israelites who were upholding Judaism being persecuted by Jews who were upholding pagan Christianity under Byzantine. So they fled, most, mostly under Emperor, Emperor uh, Justinian. Mm -hmm. A lot of us fled from different areas. The West, we fled into West Africa, we fled into Arabia, and we fled into Europe and into the Khazar areas. Go ahead. Especially at the beginning of the 5th century. That was around Justinian's time, I believe. Go ahead. Uh, read. I'm missing something. Yeah, read, read that. Read that. About 60 Jewish. That's About 60 Jewish tombstones were found in Phanagoria on the Crimean Peninsula. These show that Jews were influenced by Hellenistic culture, uh -huh. spoke and read Greek, gave their children Greek names, and even prayed in Greek. But their tombstones bear Jewish symbols, such as seven branch menorahs, shofars, and lulaks. So we prayed in Greek, spoke Greek, wrote Greek, all of that. Go ahead. Evidence was also found that the Jewish communities enjoyed a certain amount of autonomy and had uh, permanent contacts with the Babylonian Jewish community and the land of Israel. We're going to do that later on. We dealt with the Babylonian Jewish communities and Israel. Go ahead. Keep going. Keep going. From the 5th to the 7th century CE, Jewish communities of the Caucasus were strengthened by the immigration of Jews from Asia via Persia. This evidence is supported by Armenian and Georgian chronicles, all the... Although the numbers are uncertain. Yeah, it's not sure how many of us went over there. Go down to the bottom of the paragraph. Down the paper. Jews came to Khazaria right there. Jews came to Khazaria from modern-day Uzbekistan, Armenia, Hungary, Syria, Turkey, Iraq. Iraq would be Babylon. So Israelites resided and came, from, came to Khazaria from, keep in mind, from Iraq, Babylon. And the Jews that, resided from, that came from there and resided in Khazaria were in correspondence with the Jews that remained in Iraq or Babylon. Go ahead. And numerous other places. By the 10th century, the Khazars wrote in. Yeah, go to the next page. Yeah, just that right there. Khazars wrote in Hebrew letters. Because we taught them. When we dwelt there, we shared with them our culture while we resided in their land. What's what Israel does? Let me give an example what Israel did. Whenever Israel was in rulership, we would forcefully, forcefully convert the nations to follow our ways. Like in Esther, they did that. John Icranus, we did that. In the wilderness, we did that. When we were the weak, the tail, and they were the head, and we want peace within their land, we would keep our laws within their land. The nations found interest in our, in our cultures and how we conducted ourselves. We would share our way of life with them so we would have peace in, in our land. So that way, if all people on the land mass are doing the same thing, that's less confusion. And what will happen in return? Those heathens would then take our religion, when we taught them, and turn against us. Like the Arabs did, like the white men did on this side of the world, that's what they would do. They would take our, take our culture we taught them and then turn against us, like the so-called Jews have done, like, like the Arabs did, the same thing. Whenever we were on our bottom, they would, we would do that. So out of desperation for peace, we would say, listen, this is how we, this is how we live our lives, this is how we eat, this is how we drink, this is how we dress. And he's going to go, okay, okay, that sounds good. And they will overthrow us. So when we came into the land of Khazaria, we did the exact same thing in their land. They found interest in what we were doing, and we shared our culture with them. And they began to slowly converse. So I said some were, Muhammad, some were Mohammedans, some were pagan, some were Jews. But then King Obadiah made it where mostly all the Khazars became Jews, or so-called, or nominal Jews. You understand? Y'all follow what I'm yes, saying? Yes, sir. And major... Right, hold on. Um... When it comes to the land of Israel, our land, right? You know, you can the, the when you read the scripture, it says that if you don't keep the laws in the land, the land going to spew you out. You understand? So it's a reason why we force them heathens and them to observe our customs. You understand? It's a reason because when we read the scripture, it says, listen, if you don't if you don't keep the laws in, in the land, the land going to spew you out. For so for the land not to spew us out, we have to make sure that everybody in the land is keeping God's laws. All right, that's why we force the heathen and them to convert to God's laws. That's why when you go back, um, I think it was it had some people that they had put in the land, and and some first king, kings. Yeah. that was kings, right? Kings and the kings, yeah. Babylonians, yeah. Babylonians there, Babylonians did that. They had to yeah. go back and get one of our priests to come back and teach yeah. them. Because what was happening was the because lions the lions and all that was right, tying them up. Right, right, right. So that's why when you win that land, you got to be keeping God's laws. Otherwise, the land going to spew you out. Right. Go ahead, read that. And major Khazar documents from that period were written in Hebrew. 
Amelijan Prisak, a well-known researcher of Khazarian history, estimated that there were as many as 30,000 Jews in Khazaria by the 10th century. Uh -huh. During the 10th and early 11th centuries, the young Russian kingdom inherited most of the former Khazar lands. When they conquered it. Go ahead. I was yet Slav. Go ahead. Despite the loss of their nation... Despite the, the loss of Khazar losing their kingdom. Go ahead. The, Khaz the Khazar people did not disappear. Watch this. Some of them migrated to the northern Caucasus or uh -huh. westward into Hungary, Romania, and Poland. And where? And Poland. And Poland. That's where the Mastinazis is from. They, they were sheep herders in Poland and migrated their way up. Then, then they came across Hitler and so forth, and the rest is history. Let's go to, oh, I want to get now. Go to, um, he knew they weren't. They knew they weren't also. Let's go to H.G. Wells' book. H.G. Wells, I want that now. Outline of history. This is this book right here. Remember in Wikipedia mentioned H.G. Wells? Wikipedia, the outline of history, third edition revised, Macmillan version, best version. On one occasion, the Idumeans being conquered were all forcibly made Jews. So he, made that, he made that very, very clear. Go ahead. There were Arab tribes who were Jews in the time of Muhammad. And remember, the Arabs followed Judaism and turned into what? Islam. Did what? Say it again. Islam. They turned Judaism into Islam. Correct. Go ahead. And the Turkish people who were mainly Jews in South Russia in the 9th century. Edomites, Khazars. Go to, the next, go, no, that's all I want. go to the next page. I have you up, have up there. Go to page 635. That's the next one. Yep, I want that one statement. To these Jewish Khazars. To these Jewish Khazars. Right there. To these Jewish Khazars are to be ascribed the great settlements... Stop. Are to these Jewish Khazars are to be ascribed the great settlements where? Of Jews in Poland and Russia. Boom. Once again, Khazars or the Jews that resided in Russia and Poland. That's in their own encyclopedia as well. They're telling themselves. Let's go to Esau Edom again. Let's look to here again. One more and we're going to read some scripts again. Page 21, read the color red. Watch this. Watch what it says about red. The color red is as predominantly associated with the Jews and their activities as it is with that of Esau Edom. Also mm. note that there are no positive or redeeming attributes associated, associated with the color red in connection to Esau. There are no positive or redeeming attributes associated with the color red in connection to Esau. Go ahead. Or in its association to the Jews. Go ahead. Red is always representative of something bad or negative, such as bloodshed, sins, the Babylonian system. Stop! The Babylonian system. What's Esau called in Psalms 137? Yes, he is. Go ahead. War, communism, etc. Go ahead. Esau, Edom, and his, and his descendants are possessors of these characteristics. So they subscribe to the Babylonian Talmud as well. Nothing new under the sun. Go down. Esau hated by God. Esau hated by God. Perhaps the most unique and unusual attribute possessed by Esau Edom is his adverse relationship with God. Uh -huh. The script reveals that God never had any love for Esau as he did with Jacob. And in fact, God hates Esau. I have loved you, Israel, says the Lord. Yet you say... How hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage to waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Next statement. That God's hatred and anger towards Esau Edom is not a one-time event. It's conveyed in the fact that Edom was the... That Edom was the people against whom the Lord... Has indignation forever. Uh huh. Malachi one and four. Go this ahead. is no mistranslation. This is no mistranslation. As the same concept is also conveyed in the New Testament. Is it really? Go ahead. As it was written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Romans nine thirteen. Go ahead. This hatred by God towards Esau is an attribute that the human heart cannot accept or embrace. And therefore, many will try to explain it away. Apologetics. This hatred by God towards Esau is an attribute that the human heart 
cannot accept or embrace. So they make him other races. He's jaffing. That's what they do. That's 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 the that's the same thing. It's the producers of that woman's show couldn't have it, couldn't handle it either. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> and therefore, many will try to explain it away. Uh huh. The scores of theo- theologians. theologians have avoided this truth of scripture or have whitewashed it into something more appealing to human nature. Job's all of the world. John 3, 16, go ahead. God not only hates Esau, Edom, Uh and is against these people, but refers to them as the people of my curse. This curse is not just on Esau, but also his seed and his brethren. His entire race. This guy's on point. Go ahead. But I have made Esau bear. I have uncovered his secret places. We're going to read that. He's quoting stuff I want to read. Go go among. Among Esau's brethren were the Amalekites. Uh Uh-huh which were descended from one of Esau's grandsons. Uh-huh. It was these Edomite kinsmen whom God had sworn war against from generation to generation. Go ahead. God's, God's hatred of Edom is not a temporary thing, but is, but is perpetual. Yep. Go the ahead. doctrine that God loves everyone does not stand up in light of what the Bible has to say regarding God's merciless position towards the race of people called Edom. Mm-hmm. Although the churches have tried to alter God's true nature, we find that throughout the Bible, God's position towards Esau, does, Edom, does, does not, not change. change. So what are they saying? They're saying that church and the Bible are totally diametrically opposed to each other. That's what they're telling you. Yep. You, you go to church, you ain't going to get the Bible. We do, we do, there is, not, there one. is not one favorable or positive statement in the Bible in relation to Esau, not Edom. Not one. Go ahead. But how does this adverse relationship which God has towards Esau or Edom help us to identify who this character is in the world today? To help us answer this, we have to put ourselves in the role which Esau has been assigned in God's script. If God hated you and your ancestors, how would you react? And what would you do? Mm-hmm. By natural reaction, you would be against God mm-hmm. and his people. Mm-hmm. And to prevent them from finding out you are Esau. The one God is against. Knowing that if God is against something, so will his followers. Who is it that tries to conceal their identity as Edom? The one hated by God by claiming to be Israel. The one loved by God. Only one group of people reacts as though God has a hatred for them. That is the Jews. Why do you suppose the Jews form organizations such as the Anti-Defamation League to monitor and combat hate and to identify hate groups? Sound familiar? Sound familiar? SPLC, right? Go ahead. Who would, who would not Esau want to do this? Why is it that it is predominantly Jews who promote the anti-hate laws uh-huh. and other hate crime legislation? If you were Esau or Edom, would you not do the same? An Edomite would also want to infiltrate churches. Uh-huh. Go ahead. Next page. See how it gets deeper. Go ahead. Would infiltrate. also want to inf- infiltrate churches and seminaries to get God's people to believe that there is no God of hate. Esau can be saved. They just can be saved. Go ahead. Only a God of love and mercy. Uh-huh. The Jews have done just that in Christ. Them. Uh-huh. The Edomite Jews of today are the main ones who are concerned about hate, and with good reason. They are desperately, desperately trying to suppress all hate, even any acts or words that could be construed as causing mental anguish. Uh-huh. In response, you guys are Khazars, you're Edomites. Go ahead. In response to their role as being the people against whom the Lord has indignation forever, the Jews have made the concept of hate a taboo. The Jew Eli Weasel stated on that public fits tel- very well. Weasel, go ahead. The Jew Eli Weasel stated on public television that even hate of hate is dangerous. Uh-huh. This is an example of how paranoid the Edomite Jews are regarding God's hatred of them and the length they will go to eliminate from the minds of God's people any aspect of the idea of hate. Yes, God hates and has indignation for the Edomite Jews. And if any dare to take God's side on this matter, they will be met with great opposition and persecution from those who believe the Edomite Jews are God's chosen people. That's all I want. Now, for all of that to get dropped 
on the screen and hit you on the top of the biscuit. The question beckons. If he's saying that the so-called white people are not the Jews, they must know who the real Jews are. That's amazing. Jeremiah 23, you got something? Yeah, yeah. Also, right, you know how they try to discredit that they being the Jews? What they does, they says that um the the Edomites is no more. The Edomites have been wiped off from the face of the earth. You understand? So that's what they do to misguide to misguide the people from thinking that um the white people are the real descendants of Edom, the people who God hates. You understand? So they say, Oh, the Edomites have been killed off and no more Edomites are wrong no more. The whole generation been wiped off. But that's a lie. Now, a point was made earlier about how they don't argue British Caucasian, French Caucasian. Give me that map I sent you earlier out the Bible we had right there. One, one of the ways they try to get rid of the fact that Esau is still here by calling themselves white. Right. Yep. Yep. And because you said you you trying to you as a red person calling yourself white telling me Esau is gone. I'm saying no, I'm, I'm looking at him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, no talk on sense. The Khazars resided in the, the area between the Black Sea and Caspian Sea. As you can see, Caucasus Mountains. That's what the British don't argue. Remember, you have French people, you have French Edomites living in Italy, you have Edomites living in Spain, you have Edomites living in Germany, but they all acknowledge that they're all Caucasians. They all weren't living in there. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm saying that they all agree that they're all the same race of people, regardless. They all agree that they're the same exact people. That the Caucasus Mountains is right there. You have Armenia. That's all the same. The Kardashians, that's their fathers from Armenia. That's them. Mm -hmm. Ca There's pure Caucasian Armenia. Damn. A straight call. A straight Esau. All right? Then you got Iraq. You have Iraq right under it. Where, remember, remember, Israel fled from Mesopotamia. From the Byzantine, we fled up. We fled up north. And we came across Khazars and dwelt there. All right? It's right under there. Mesopotamia is Iraq or Babylon. Babylon fled from Babylon up north. Now, let's go to um, Jeremiah 23, 24. Back to the scripts. Jeremiah 23, 24. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 24. This goes in context of what he was saying in that book. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? No. Saith the Lord. Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? Yes, he does. Let's go to Jeremiah 49, verse 9. I have heard what, what the prophet said. That prophesy lies in my name, mm -hmm. saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. Got Jeremiah 49, verse 9? No, 49, verse 9. Jeremiah 49, verse 9 and 10. Jeremiah, chapter 49 and verse 9 and 10. If grape gatherers come to thee, would they not leave some gleaning grapes? Jeremiah is quoting Obadiah. He's saying it again. The prophet is saying it again and again and again. Go ahead. If thieves by night, they will destroy till they have enough. Go ahead. But I have made Esau bear. I have uncovered his secret places. Watch this. And he shall not be able to hide himself. He shall not what? He shall not be able to hide he himself. He will no longer be able to hide himself, who he is. In the end, everyone's going to know this is the nation that God hates. Let's kill them all. Go ahead. His seed is spoiled, and his brethren, and his neighbors, and he is not. Meaning he's gone. He's going to get eradicated off the earth. He can't stay in it forever. The, 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 the statement before that about him. He should not everybody be able to hide go, himself. Yes. Repeat that again. He should, I said um, that he will not be able to hide himself. Everyone's going to know who he is, and they're going to say it's the people that God hates. And that's, destroy him. That's going to come to pass in Isaiah chapter 13. Right. And Isaiah 14. That's mm -hmm. where that prophecy is at. Yep. It said that, and it, the Most High didn't even call him he. The Most High said, it, it shall be as a chase rope and as a sheep that no man taketh up. That's where that's going to come into play at. Yep. They're going to be like, you're the fugitive from justice. And the nation's going to chase. They ain't going to be able to hide nowhere. Nope. And you're going to be like a diseased sheep. You ain't going to try to hide them that day. You're going to be like, leave them in the street for the people to get them. Yep. <laughs> That's what it mean when it says, as a sheep that no man taketh yep. up. If you were hide a good sheep, come here and hide, hide, hide. You'd be like, no, man, you sick. Get out there. Isaiah 34. <laughs> verse, um, verse 1. 
That's why the most I had to bless this man with those weapons. Yep. Because that's the only reason why he hasn't been taken down yet. Deacon Malachi, you did a good class on that thing a while back. Tubal Cain and all that. That protected him. Isaiah 34 verse 1. Come near, ye nations, to hear, and hearken, ye people. Let the earth hear, and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations. All nations, go ahead. And his fury upon all their armies. Go ahead. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them up to the slaughter. This is the aftermath of, that, of the destruction. Go ahead. Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses. And the mountains shall be melted with their blood. Dang, and all the host of heaven shall be dissolved. Shall be what? Shall be dissolved. Go ahead. And the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. That's a mushroom cloud, nuclear explosion. Go ahead. And the, he the heavens that it's talking about, I ain't talking about the most high's heaven. Mm -hmm. That's talking about Esau's kingdom. Yep. And all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine. Hold that. Give Second Peter 3 and 10 as a precept for that about being dissolved. Second Peter 3, verse 10. Let me go back to that again. Oh, okay. Second Peter 3, verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. That's the heavens that it was talking about in Isaiah when it says, and the, hev and the host of heaven shall be dissolved. It's talking about this white man's kingdom, yep. so-called white man's kingdom. That's what it's talking about there. Yeah. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Jump, the, jump down to verse, uh, what I wanted, verse, verse 10. Verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Uh -huh. In the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. Whose heavens? Esau's heavens. Go ahead. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. What can do that? A nuclear weapon. That God caused Esau to build. Yep. He caused Esau to build a weapon to his own destruction. Yep. Go ahead. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. Shall be what? Dissolved. Shall be dissolved. That's Isaiah 34. Shall be dissolved. Go ahead. What man of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Go ahead. Look how, how, how should you be known that day, is, that day is coming? How should you conduct yourself knowing that day is coming soon? Go ahead. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved. The heavens being on fire shall be dissolved. Go ahead. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Go ahead. That's now, all I want. Isaiah 34 again. And verse, where we at? Four? Verse 4. Yeah. Isaiah 34, verse 4. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down, as the leaf falleth off from the vine. Satellites, bind. planes, all of that. Plane, helicopters, all of that. Go ahead. And as a falling fig from the fig tree. Go ahead. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Let's see what heaven it is. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumia. That's the heaven he's talking about. Their heaven, Idumia. Go ahead. And upon the people of my curse to judgment. Because they're condemned all throughout the Bible. So they're people of the curse. Go ahead. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness and with the blood of lambs and goats. With the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Basra. Basra is the capital of Edom. He's going to destroy their capital. What's their capital today? America is their capital today. Go ahead. And a great slaughter in the land of Idumia. There's no record of God coming down and doing this to Edom in, his, in ancient time. Nowhere. None. Go ahead. And the unicorns shall come down with them. And the bullocks with the bulls in their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust made fat with fatness. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. The controversy, who the real Jew is and who isn't. Right. There could whose be land it belongs to, whose land does it belong to. Exactly. There could be no salvation without the destruction of your enemies. Right. That's what that's saying also. Exactly what that's saying. Go ahead. And the streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone, 
And the land thereof shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night nor day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation, it shall lie waste. Keep that, keep that in mind. Smoke go up forever and ever. Go ahead. None shall pass through it forever and ever. Now, mind you, the modern day Edom today is called Petra. Arabs live there today. So they ain't referring to that. Okay, the land of, Israel, the land of Edom today is inhabited by Arabs. So it's not referring to actual land of Esau at all. It's referring to their future capital, the last days, which will be America, D.C., New York. That's going to be in flames. America's going to be in flames and burning pitch forever. Go ahead. But the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it. The owl also and the raven shall dwell in it. And he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. They shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom. But none shall be there, and all her princes shall be nothing. Nothing will be there. No one left. No one's there. Go ahead. No zombies that the movies have it. No one will be there. Everyone dead. Everything is dead, but those animals are going to be over there. Go ahead. And thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof. Uninhabited. Go ahead. And it shall be in habitation of dragons. Or devils. That's what it says in Revelations. And a court for owls. The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island, and the satyr shall cry to his fellow. It's a bird. Go ahead. The screech owl also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. Let's get Isaiah 63 now. Let's see if it changes. Isaiah 63, we're going to be verse 1 to 6. Keep in mind, Esau is referred to as what? Also, what are they called also? The daughter. Keep that in mind. Isaiah 63, verse 1. Isaiah 63, verse 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? Now this is the Lord. This is a, this is a third person. The Lord is speaking to Isaiah asking, who is this fine brother walking through with the armor and the bloody garments? Who is this guy walking well, through, the, through Basra? I love this dialogue. Talking about here. himself. Yes. Go ahead. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This, that is, glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel? This is a conversation, the way it's set up. Read it again. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel? So the question is, okay, well, why are you red? Read it again. I'm sorry, Deacon. Read it again. Start it off. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel? Start the verse again before that. Who is this that cometh from Edom? That's how the question is going. Who is this that cometh from Edom? This is Isaiah. He sees this. Go ahead. With dyed garments from Basra. With dyed garments from Basra. Go ahead. This that is glorious in his apparel. The answer is it is I that is glorious in my apparel. Go ahead. Traveling in the greatness of his strength. Traveling. So this is what Isaiah. He sees this. Traveling in the greatness of his strength. Go ahead. I that speak in righteousness mighty to save. So he's answering him. He said, it is me. I that speak in righteousness ready to save. Go ahead. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel? Okay, I see that you're glorious in your apparel. Okay, so then why are you red in your apparel? Mm -hmm. And thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine. Okay, you got it, right? It's fine. It's going to be glorious garment, gold armor. It's going to be bad. He's going to be glorious. He's going to come in his glory. All the power he held back, all the time, watch us get killed, hung, shot, stabbed. He said, I'm going to hold him back. Now it's my time to shine. Go ahead. Verse 3. I have trodden down the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. Go ahead. For I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments. That's why the garments is dyed red. Back in the following verses. Go ahead. And I will stain all my raiment. That's why it's red in the of power. He's, he's, he's answering himself. Who is this guy? It's me. Right. I'm killing everybody. You are? Yes, I'm killing everybody. I think they call this question and response. That's question what I was trying response. to say. Right. Yeah, That's what this is written like that. For the day of vengeance is mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, mine own arm brought salvation unto me. I need no help. In my fury, it upheld me. my anger encouraged me to kill you even more. Go ahead. And I will tread down the people in mine anger. I'm going to stomp y'all out. 
Go ahead. And make them drunk in my fury. And I will bring down their strength to the earth. Bring them into slavery, into hell, as he's talking about. Now, let's get Isaiah 13. Isaiah 34. Isaiah 13. I'm with the last few verses regarding Babylon's judgment. But it sounds very much similar to Esau's judgment. It's very odd. Isaiah 13. And we're going to be verse 19 to 22. Real quick. Isaiah 13 and verse 19. Because remember, the ancient Babylon, Cyrus took it over and moved right in. He didn't burn anything. Nothing was destroyed. He moved. He conquered them. It was infiltrated. The Medes took over, and then he, the Persia took over from there. Moved right in. No burning, nothing. None of that. So what's this going into? Isaiah 13, verse 19. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Babylon didn't fall that way. Ancient Babylon didn't fall through that Sodom and Gomorrah fell. Go ahead. It shall, never, it shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Are people in Iraq today? Yes. Go ahead. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there. Are Arabs in Iraq today? Yes. Go ahead. Neither shall the shepherds make their fold there, but wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. Watch this. And owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. That's Edom's judgment. Why is it going about Babylon? Go ahead. And the wild beasts of the island shall cry in their desolate houses, and dragons in their pleasant palaces. Place of devils. Habitation of devils. Revelations 18. Go ahead. And her time is near to come, and her days shall not be prolonged. So who's this Babylon talking about? Edom. Daughter of Babylon, Edom. Same judgment for both. Um, Isaiah 34 and Isaiah 13 are saying the exact same thing. Saying the exact same thing regarding the exact same place, different name. Amos 9. Verse 11. Amos chapter 9 and verse 11. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen. And close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old. And I will store the torch of Israel into one nation once again and give them their king, which is Christ, who comes out of David. Next verse, the before and the after. Next verse. Verse 12. That they may possess the remnant of Edom. We may possess the remnant of Edom. Go ahead. And of all the heathen, which are called by my name. Call themselves by his name. Jews. Go ahead. Save the Lord that doeth this. So now. Get me Acts 15. I went there for a reason. Acts 15 and verse 13. Acts 15, verse 13. And after, and after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, hearken unto me. So James says. Simon. Sim, yeah, Sim, Simon, Simon, Simon Peter. Uh -huh. Simon had declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Go ahead. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down. And the Lord sent Christ to teach the northern kingdom first, and then he sent Peter later with Cornelius to regather the northern kingdom back to the southern kingdom. That's why I said to this, to this action agrees the prophet of Amos. He will restore the tabernacle of David that's fallen. I mean, both kingdoms being divided. He will bring Jew and Gentile or Ephraim and Judah again to gather together again. Y'all follow what I'm saying? Go ahead. And I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles, upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Read 17 again. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord. Stop. What does it say in Amos 9.12? Noah doesn't say possess, nor mention Edom in this chapter. Notice that? That's kind of odd. Why would he leave that out? There's a reason why I left that out. He spoke, he spoke in wisdom. Read again. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord uh -huh. and all the Gentiles, Heathen. upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. How they seek the Lord? When we're possessing them. But he left that out. Why? Get me real quick. Jewish Diaspora, Volume 1, 
The other brought it out a while back. I'm going to show you why he left it out. What time period was? Who was ruling at this time? Rome. Correct. Jewish Diaspora, Volume 1, page 20. I'm going to show you why I didn't mention us possessing Edom during this time. I thought I was knew how to speak to people. They didn't sit there and curse out Esau like idiots. They knew how to use wisdom when they spoke. That's like Paul, that's like Paul spoke to Agrippa early in Acts 26. He spoke the same way James right here. Uh, read to us, uh, read unlike Greek civilization. Read that. Unlike Greek civilization, which not only threatened but also enriched rabbinical culture, culture. the Roman Empire was single-mindedly bent on destroying Jewish civilization. Rome was bent on destroying us. Watch this. Rome was the engine of irreversible exile. Of our irreversible, because once Israel got scattered from Rome's exile, that was it for us. We were scattered and remained scattered till now. Go ahead. The power that destroyed the Jewish homeland and scattered the Jewish people throughout the empire. Uh Uh-huh. In Jewish legend, in Jewish legend, liturgy, liturgy and art, Rome, Rome is a symbol of Israel's implacable enemy. Who could that be? Read. To escape censorship. Not to escape censorship. Go ahead. And arrests by the non-Jewish authorities. Uh-huh. Rabbinic sages often refer. Or the prophets often. Go ahead. Often referred to Rome euphemistically using the names of biblical enemies such as Esau. Edom, and Amalek. Uh-huh. The Ark of Titus, depicting triumphant Romans bringing captive Jews to Rome in chains, has also come to symbolize the curse of exile. So, I'm, sh- stop. so I'm showing you this, when Israel would speak against, they couldn't speak against Esau like that. They would, they would call Rome Edom. They had to use code words or speak in a certain way to keep themselves from getting in trouble. So when he said, he didn't say here, we're going to possess Edom. He said that they may seek after the Lord. He, he, Cut the verse in half, pretty much. He made a statement. He knew he was he was quoting Amos. When you read um, verse sixteen, you know what he's going to Amos nine eleven. Read, read it again, verse sixteen again. Verse um, sixteen again. Acts fifteen sixteen. After this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which is fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord. Now, remember, verse 16 is referring to us taking our kingdom back. You can't talk like that when Rome is there. So he had to use wisdom. He said, okay, well, well, once we're established, all nations will seek the Lord and so forth. But he didn't say how about we're going to possess Edom. That was left out because Rome was wrong at the time. That's why Paul wrote in Romans 9. He said Esau, Pharaoh. He didn't say we're going to rule over Edom. We're going to strip. He didn't say that. He says Esau is hated. Esau hated, I raised thee up as Pharaoh. Paul was using wisdom in Romans 9. He, wasn't, so he was very indirect in Romans 9. We know what he's saying because we're his people. So and we know what James is saying, we're his people. But the heathens are like, okay, we seek after the Lord. Remember what Paul said to Agrippa, we'll all seek the Lord. Oh, oh. In slavery. But he ain't say that. Go ahead. So I got a question for you, Deacon. Well, not you, the men in the audience, to see if they picked up on what you just brought out. He just proved to you in the scriptures and with documents, the people that have researched the Bible thoroughly, that our forefathers spoke in cold words. Were they cowards for speaking in cold words? Because you got dusty Israelite counts right now saying that because we're not out in the street, they've been watching all, and they're in our class, they're online right now. But last week when I said to be careful of them, as soon as the class went off, they edited, I think it was, they edited where you spoke, and they showed it back to their camp. And another dusty camp that I, I don't even know who these guys are. They look like they belong in a nursing home. Um, they did a video defending Esau. Well, all this undisputable proof that we have here, immediately after the class went off, they did a, vin- a video defending Esau, another camp, that believes all you're supposed to do with the scriptures is go and curse the white man because that's how they get their audience. Okay? They put a video up. Okay? And what they try to convince their uh, followers that believe that they're the toughest things since sliced bread, that we are not doing the work of the most high because we're articulating to you how to be raised up as a nation instead of putting focus 
are arguing with white people. Okay, so Deacon Aitan just proved with documents here and with the scriptures that our forefathers, their primary focus was on raising up the nation of Israel first and giving them hope and showing them that the conditions are going to change. Right, let me give you an example of the for your point. Just think about what you're saying. Matthew 23, Christ is cursing out our people the whole chapter, right? Am I right or wrong? Show me a chapter where the Messiah curses out Esau the whole chapter, one time. Okay. There's nowhere in the Bible you find a Messiah cursing out Esau throughout the entire chapter. That's not one. And I challenge any camp that attacks us like that to show me where the Messiah cursed out Herod or Rome the entire chapter. Show me one. When he encountered heathens, he would ignore them. That's right. Right, right. He would ignore them. He, they had to beg him, please heal my daughter. That's Sorry, right. Sorry, because you're a dog, your daughter's healed. Right. And when Herod questioned him, he ignored him. He said, get this guy out of here. Something get, wrong. get out of here, right. He went to Pilate. He said, what is truth? He swam very, very short with him. Yes. They screamed at him because he wouldn't answer the questions direct. They said, answer me plainly. Are you who you say you are? He was like, if thou sayest. Right. Right. Okay, so. He could have said, hell yeah, nigga. Yes, he could have said just what, just what the Israelite counts want us to do to, today. He could have said, hell yeah, niggas. I'm the son of God, and I'm going to kill all you white people. But why did he not do that? Who knows why he didn't do that? Okay, because he was using wisdom. Yep. He was using wisdom. His focus is on the same focus Israel United on Christ is yep. now. We don't care about what the white man is doing. We don't gather our audience based on our hatred for white people. We gather our audience based on us, us being the rulers of the planet Earth. So our focus is on getting y'all in righteousness. That's why we talk about marriage. That's why we talk about raising the kids. That's why we talk about having healthy bodies. That's why we talk about the brotherhood. We don't constantly keep getting articles pointing out, look what the police did to us. Look what the white man is doing. We don't care. We already understand that those are the curses, and that's a part of our captivity. So our focus is making you a better person and us as a nation a better person. In time, that will stop. Okay? In right. time, it's going to stop. Okay? Once we come to the level of greatness where we are. So I want you to understand the difference between us and the other Israelite groups. They don't know how to teach you nothing. They don't know how to go into the history. They don't know how to go into the scriptures. And look at these people who are fighting against us to articulate you that you are better, that you are greater. And we need to fix ourselves first before we take them down. Right. Read, 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 I'm sorry, real quick, real quick. Read that again. The, um, euphemistically called them Right. Rome. That's what I wanted you to get. Yeah, euphemistically. You, you missed it. Uh, Refer to Rome. They didn't get that. Yeah, read it again. Yeah, to escape word. censorship. Read it again. Where is that? Right the there. To one. escape Put censorship. The right there. To escape censorship. Right to escape censorship and arrest by the non Jewish authorities, rabbinic sages often referred to Rome euphemistically. Mean code words symbolically. Go ahead. Using the names of biblical enemies such as Esau, Edom, and Amalek. He called Rome Esau, Edom, Amalek. Why not Moab or Midian or, or Canaanites? Right. Why of all nations we call them that? Because we knew that's who they were. That's why we call them that. And what's getting them mad right now? The same words we're using. Yep. Edom. We're not calling them anything else. We're calling those words because historically and biblically, that's who you are. That's who you... Right. That's okay. Right. right. That's how you know where the real fight is. This paper tiger stuff that you're talking about, what these other guys are doing, getting on, on cursing people out on the corner, they ain't doing a damn thing. The real fight is against, is against what, this, what this same beast is trying to do to you. Right. Okay? Locking you up, giving you bad education, d destroying our people wholesale with the things that they're doing in the society. We're trying to raise you up above that to be a nation among us. That's how you're going to fight. When we go to Haiti, mm -hmm. Haiti's dangerous. Yep. You went out there, men surrounding you can put you to death any time. Teach out there with power and might, no fear in our face whatsoever. Jamaica has dangerous areas. We talk out there, no fear whatsoever. Baltimore streets dangerous. Brother got killed. Um, Freddie, Freddie, um, Freddie Gray got killed. We were out there, first on the scene, dangerous area. Out there teaching, no fear. What the hell are you talking about? Where's the fear? Hold up. Deacon, let me say something. There's like a, a brown got killed. We was out there, too. Out there. Interfered. Uh, we inter did an interview with the with the, um, with the mother, the uh, mother-in-law. Okay. You yeah, understand? Real quick. Ahead, real quick, in Trinidad, there's a there's a camp out there right now. There's a place in Trinidad called Laventil. 
Right. Those brothers never went up there. They call it love and They kill. don't, right. We never was up went there. up there. The first camp, first time we went up there, it was the only camp to go up there. So let's go back. Y'all keep taking notes, haters. Page 94. Page 94 of Jewish Civilizations. Jewish Civilizations. We're going to use this book right here. Page 94. Don't show me. Page 94. In the book Nistarat, the rabbi Simeon Bar Yoha. Now secret. remember, we read in the um, Jewish diaspora book how we wrote in code about our enemies, right? Go ahead. The Secrets of Rabbi Simeon Ben Yo Yoha. Written in Palestine in the 8th century, Dark ages. there is a beautiful legend which expresses the feelings of the Jews of that generation and their hopes for their people. And when he saw that the kingdom of the sons of Ishmael would eventually spread throughout the world. During this time, you had the Byzantine Empire, which was Rome, and you had the Arab Ishmaelites trying to take over. And you had the Khazars in the middle. So you had, he said he called them Ishmaelites once again. Go ahead. Simeon Bar Yoha wept and said, Lord of the universe. Is it not enough for your sons with the evil kingdom of Edom, Rome? Stop. Evil kingdom what? Of Edom, Rome. We call Edom, Rome. Rome, Edom. Go ahead. Did to them? When they, when they destroyed us in 70 AD, go ahead. That you must also send the kingdom of Ishmael against us? The caliphs, go ahead. The Holy One, blessed be he, answered, do not fear, son of man. For the Holy One, blessed be he, brings the kingdom of Ishmael only to save you from this evil one. And he sets a prophet of his choice over them who will conquer the land of Israel for Messiah. them. Go ahead. And they will come and restore it to the Jews. So to who? To the Jews. Go ahead. And there will be a great hatred between them and the children of Esau, Rome. Rome. Esau is Rome, once again. Can, now go to... Hmm. No, go, Gen go to um, Genesis 10, real quick. Genesis 10. I can move past it now. Genesis 10 and verse 2. Genesis chapter 10 and verse 2. The sons of Japheth, Gomer and Magog and Med Medai and Javit and Tubal and Meshach Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me get there. Read again, verse 2. Genesis 10, verse 2. The sons of Japheth, Gomer and Magog and Madai and Javan and Tubal and Meshach and Tyrus. Go ahead. And the sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz. Ashkenaz. Yeah, yeah. Magog, Ashkenaz. Go ahead. And the sons of Go... You want verse 2 again? Yeah, that's two again. Verse 2. The sons of Japheth, Gomer and Magog. Russia. And Madai. The Medes. And... Madai and Javin, the Greeks, and Tubal, and Meshach, and Tyrus, uh -huh. and the sons of Gomer. Gomer will be Germany, France, some people. Go ahead. They ruled over that area. Go ahead. Ashkenaz. Ashkenaz is Germany. And Rif Rifath, and T Togomar, uh -huh. and the sons of Javin. That's the, that's the people, the inhabitants of the Greece. Javin. Go ahead. Elisha, and Tarshish, Kittim. Italy, Rome. And Dodanum. Dodanum. Stop. That's all I want. So now, we're going to get back to this. So now, notice Israel called Rome Edom, right? Rome, the ancient name for Rome is Kittim, right? Ancient, the ancient name for Rome is Kittim. Kittim is Japheth. So why is Israel calling a Japhetic people, nation, Edomites? Because Esau conquered the Romans, the original Romans. That's why they're calling Rome Edom, because Edom took over Rome and took it, it took over, and, and took the, and took the place of the of the original Romans, which were dark, and said we're Rome now. Likewise, the Greeks, Javan, they conquered that area and took it over, and became Javan or Greeks. Every identity Esau has is stolen. Yep, everyone. everything. Now let's go to Babylonian Jewry. I'll get back to that. Babylonian Jewry, read that during the, um, during, the, we're going to read to the part where it says, directed to it. Stop from during. Babylonian Jewry, during the generations in which the Romans succeeded in dimming the glow of the Jewish center in Palestine, Babylonian Jewry was well off. There were neither conversions nor plunder there, and neither Greece, Byzantium, nor Edom, Rome ruled them. No what? No who? Nor Edom, Rome ruled them. Nor Edom, Rome ruled them. One and the same. Go ahead. 
And the Lord did the Jews a favor. And they lived in Babylonia with their Torah from the exile of King Jehoiachin until these last generations. Stop. Get Ezra 2. Ezra 1 verse 2. These Jews remained in Babylon all the way up until the time even after Rome. Ezra 2 verse 1. I mean 1 verse 2. Ezra 1 verse 2. Ezra chapter 1 verse 2. Thus saith Cyrus king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. Watch verse 4. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth. Those of you who remain in the place of your exile. Go ahead. Let the men of his place help with him, help with him, help him with silver. Those who choose to stay in Babylon help those who choose to return to Jerusalem. So a lot of our people remained in Babylon and stayed there for years, centuries, centuries, centuries. Go back to the Jews. Go back to the book again. You were at what? You were at um the Jews. The Jews who had been living in Babylonia since the exile of Jehoiachin. Since Babylonian captivity. Became very numerous, outnumbering any other Jewish center in the diaspora. Uh -huh. There were large areas and big cities in which the Jewish population constituted a majority. Uh -huh. This jury, which its states and religious institutions, was the pride of the Jewish people. And difficult inquiries Questions. from all the lands of the diaspora like were, were directed to it. So the Jews that reside in Kazaria, any questions they had, they would go right back and ask the Babylonians in Iraq, which is right under. Remember I showed you that map? The Caucasus Mountains and Mesopotamia is right on the bottom. They want any inquiries, they will go back to them. This was the case during the periods of the Severim, the Babylonian Jewish scholars in the period 500 to 700 CE and the, and the Guineum, scholars in Babylonia from the 6th to the 11th centuries until the end of the 11th century. Yeah. The Jews as well as the other inhabitants of Babylonia regarded the Arab conquerors as liberators. Because the Arabs um, conquered the Byzantine Empire, so they were happy to see that. But the Arabs eventually overthrew them too and sold them out of there. That's all I want. So now these, these Israelites in Babylon here, they're the ones that subscribe to the Talmud. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that dealt with the Talmud. And these, some of these Jews from that were in Babylonia migrated into Khazaria and brought the Talmud to the Khazars up there. You understand? That's how it got it. That's why I read earlier in the Diaspora book how Jews migrated from Turkey, Syria, and Iraq into the Khazarian settlements and shared their culture with the Khazars there. That's how the Talmud got in their hands in the first place. Then over time, when the, when the Khazars gained um, popularity of being so-called Jew nominals, they start to add on to the Talmud, add more stuff of their own nonsense, or their own um, teachers. Read Khazars, page, um, the Khazars, next page, go over 95. In Khazars. this period of, of glory for the autonomous Jewish community in Babylonia, the religion of the Jews and their way of life attracted many persons. Including the Khazars. Watch this. Numerous tribes in the Arabian Peninsula and in the various lands of the Near and Middle East adopted Judaism. Like Ishmael, they turned into Islam. Go ahead. The most famous of these were the Khazars. Uh -huh. The land of the Khazars in southern Russia extended from the Caspian Sea to the Black Sea. And in between both is the Caucasus Mountains. Go ahead. As far as Crimea, the Khazars were... Uh, Semi-nomadic semi pagan tribe Somewhat traveling it means Go ahead. Whose chief was the Kagan uh -huh. At the beginning of the 8th century The Khazars became very strong By virtue of their domination Of the trade route Between the Byzantine Empire And the Far East And Israelites For this reason Both the Byzantine emperors And the Baghdad caliphs Were interested in cultivating The Khazars And in bringing them Under their influence Go ahead. By winning The by winning them over to their religion. Uh -huh. Paganism was on its last legs. Kagan Bullen of the Khazars, who reigned over his people in the middle of the 8th century, decided to abandon his pagan faith, but could not make up his mind to adopt. We read earlier in the encyclopedia how he had a Jew, um, Arab, and a Christian present their religions to him, and he chose 
they both he chose Judaism because both religions came from Judaism. Y'all remember that in the encyclopedia? Mm -hmm. We read that earlier. So I'm showing you cross reference over and over again. Right. It just and, said bullying in the other part, so that's why I was waiting for Cajun bullying because that's right. what that, it's talking about the same person. Yep, same person. What's important about what the deacon brought out is normally when we prove this history, we use Arthur Coles as a 13th tribe. Now he's showing it to you in an encyclopedia, referencing backing up what Arthur Coles wrote. Right. Because the argument that the apologetics have is the Edomites were destroyed already. Okay? So he just proved to you with historical accounts of their writings, not stuff that we made up, that they were still documenting who the Israelites are long after Christ died. So Christ gave us a time period when you read in Revelation, uh, Matthew chapter 24. He gave us a 2,000 year period to look for for his return and the fall of the rulers now. So how could the apologetics, if they ever present that question to you and they try to dismiss you, ah, Esau has been, uh, all that judgment on Esau has happened. The time period we looked for was from the time Christ died until now. You keep them in that time frame and get them to prove to you that Esau already got the judgment. You ain't going to find it. Yep. All you find about is them rising up and taking over us and taking our history. Okay? And we have historical documents to prove. So they can't step in the ring with us. So all they're going to do is play on your ignorance. That's why the stuff that the deacon is bringing out now, you got to keep it to memory. If Esau fell, when did he fell? Because their own people are saying when they came to rise in power and stole our identity. Right. I'm going to show you now. Go to page 18 of the Iron Curtain. That's this book here mm -hmm. written by uh, John Beatty. The Iron Curtain over America means people are being lied to. Hmm. What's the date on the publication of that book? Because we got to start using those also. 1951. 1951. 50 years ago. Tell me when the white man fell within those 50 years. Page 18. We're going to start the line. Go, yeah, go to Judaizers. Like We're going to go to the followers. It's the Judaizers Khazars. Where the line is. Read that. Tell me fast. Where is it? The Judaized Khazars underwent further dispersion. When the Russians overthrew the Khazarian kingdom, they dispersed into areas of Europe. Watch this. Both northwestward into Lithuanian. Lithuanian and Polish areas. And where? Into Lithuanian and Polish areas. The Judaized Khazars, which were Edomites, which originally came from Mount Sierra, migrated into Polish areas. Go ahead. And also within Russia proper and the Ukraine. And became Russian Jews. In the Jewish Encyclopedia, volume 4, page 1, says the exact same thing. Deacon, it says Judaize. What Judaize mean? They were converted. They were converted yeah. It's telling you in 1951 about the conversion. But you got Edom, Esau rising up now. The apologetics saying no. We don't know what we're talking about. We're using their own records to shut them down. Go we didn't write this. Go to page 19 um, and read the no, revelations. The bottom of, no, go, go down to the bottom of page 18. The relations. Go down, go down. Re La yeah, right there, relations. Relations between Slavs and the Judaized Khazars. The other Europeans who weren't converted. Go ahead. In their midst were never happy. The reasons were not racial. So they were the same people. There wasn't a racial issue. Go ahead. For the Slavs had absorbed many minorities. They intermingled. Go ahead. But were ideological. They had, ide they had ideological differences, religious differences. Go ahead. The rabbis sent for by Kaken yeah, Obadiah, Obadiah. were educated in and were zealots from for the Babylonian. The rabbis Talmud. that were sent were Israelites that were sent in from Babylonian Jewry. Remember Jewish civilizations book, with, to teach them how to keep the laws. So they were sent in by, by um, Cajun Obadiah to educate them. And they were treat, treated well, lived, lived happily, all that stuff. Go ahead. Which it, after long labors by many hands had been completed on December 2nd, 499. Uh-huh, they completed in, another um, Tamu. Go ahead. In the thousands of synagogues which were built in the Khazar Canaanite, the imported rabbis and their successors were in complete control of the political, social, and religious religious thought of their people. So significant was the Babylonian Talmud and, and as the principal cause of Khazar resistance to Russian efforts to end their political and religious separatism, and so significant also are the modern sequels, including those in the United States, that an extensive quotation on the subject from the great history of the Jews by Professor H. Greats. Watch this, what he said about the Talmud, read this. 
The Talmud must not be regarded as an ordinary work composed of 12 volumes. It possesses absolutely no similarity to any other literary production, but forms without any figure of speech a world of its own, which must be judged by its peculiar laws. It makes things up. Watch this. The Talmud contains much that is frivolous, of which it treats with great gravity and seriousness. It treats things as nonsense seriously. It further reflects the various superstitious practices and views of its Persian birthplace. Iraq. Persian birth or Iranian birthplace. Go ahead. Which presume the uh, efficacy and of the Demona of demonical. De de demonical medicine. So Talmud deals with demonical medicine, magic. Go ahead. Of magic incantations. That's called the Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Miraculous cures and interpretations of dreams. It also contains isolated instances of uncharitable judgments and decrees against the members of other nations and religions. And finally, it against other I mean, like black folks. It talks about about black people and Christ. Mm -hmm. He's burning in hell and excrement, some crazy nonsense. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And if and finally, it favors an incorrect exposition of the scriptures, accepting as it does tasteless misrepresentations. Go ahead. More than six centuries lie petrified in the Talmud. Small wonder then that the sublime, sublime and the common, the great and the small, the grave and the ridiculous, the altar and the ashes, the Jewish and the heathenish be discovered side by side. The same thing in the Talmud. The Go Babylonian ahead. Talmud is especially distinguished from the Jerusalem or Palest Palestine Talmud. The Talmud of uh, Palestine was basically um, oral, basically a re repeat of the Bible, but oral. That's all it is. Go ahead. By the flights of thought, the penetration of mind, the flashes of genius which rise and vanish again. It was for this reason that the Babylonian rather than the Jerusalem Talmud became the fundamental possession of the Jewish so race. So Edomites, so Edomite Khazars referred the Babylonian Talmud over the Jerusalem Talmud or the laws. Why? They're because they're the daughter of Babylon, that's why. Okay, okay. yes, they're satanic, they're evil, they're right. demons, and you just Satan. read there that the writings are that of a satanic nation, nature. Yep. So that's why they preferred it, and it's important that he brought this out because over my years of teaching, people always say, why you don't use the Talmud? Why you don't use the Talmud? I've never went into it. I've just heard bad things about it, but he just documented it here. Okay, I've never picked it up and read it to search it out. Everything that I scanned was from the internet, and it was always something wicked. It was nothing that lined up with what the prophet said. But you have Edomites, and you have dumb Negroes who don't know the origin of it, trying to challenge you, saying that there's other writings we don't know about. I'm going to show you. Go ahead. It's very good. It's life and breath. It's life, breath. It's very soul. They believe in that. Next one. Next page. Right there. Nature and mankind. Right there. Nature and mankind. Powers and events were for the Jewish nation insignificant, non-essential, a mere phantom. The only true reality was the Talmud. That's their world that revolves around. The Talmud. Only the Talmud. It's each other and the Talmud. Watch there. Read that. Not merely. Not merely educated by the Talmud, but actually living the life of its Babylonian background. So the Amalekites, the Edomites, Khazars lived a Babylonian lifestyle through the Talmud. Because they're the daughter of Babylon, along with all the rest of their people. Go ahead. Which they may have regarded with increased devotion because most of the Jews of Mesopotamia had embraced Islam. Uh -huh. The rabbi governed Khazars had no intention whatsoever of losing their identity by becoming Russianized or Christian. Uh -huh. The intransigent, intrans intransigent attitude of the rabbis was increased by their realization that their power would be lost if their people accepted controls other than Talmudic. They were trying to stay, they, while they were in Russia, they wanted to stay separate. Go ahead. These controls by rabbis were responsible not only for basic mores, but for, but for such externals as the, as the peculiarities. Pe peculiarities of dress and, and hair. Stop. So how they dress and wear their hair is Babylonian. The curls, the black hat looking like demons, that's Babylonian. That's not in the Bible. The yarmulkes, that's all pagan. That's how the Roman Catholics wear yarmulkes and Muslims wear yarmulkes and Israelis wear yarmulkes. It's all pagan nonsense. It ain't in the Bible. So they're dressed in hair. All, they live a, ba a Babylonian Talmudic lifestyle of Satan. Stop, stop. Go to, read where it says, this is Jewish diaspora Wikipedia. Read during the siege. Where is that? During the siege. After 70 CE, you're going to see okay. during the siege. During the siege, 
The Romans destroyed the second temple in most of Jerusalem. That's 70 AD. Watch this. This event marked the beginning of the Roman exile. This beginning marked, marked the beginning of the Roman exile called what? Also called Edom exile. You can't make this up, man. You can't make this up. They called it Edom exile. Go ahead. Jewish leaders and elite were exiled from the land, killed or taken to Rome as slaves. So they called the Roman exile in 70 AD the Edom exile. Because Rome and Edom are one and the same. Go to um, Luke 21, 24. After this happened, what took place? Luke 21, 24. Once Rome surrounded us, and we read verse 20 and down, 24 is the point that I want. Luke chapter 21, verse 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword. And Rome will surpass us, um, compass us. Go ahead. And shall be led away captive into all nations. Which we were. Go ahead. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles today? Ishmael and Esau. Go ahead. Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Until the times of Daniel, his prophecy of the, of the, of, um, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and the eagle, and the extension of the eagle, which is America, is no more. That's what he's going into. All right, so once that took place, the Edom exile took place, you were scattered among all the nations. And we still are today. And the land is trodden down by imposters and Ishmaelites. Let's go to 1 Maccabees 1 and 1. Remember what I brought to your attention earlier about the red dragon, how all the heads are related to the same beast. Greece, Rome, Spain, France, Russia, Germany. Y'all know the rest. First Maccabees 1 and 1. First Maccabees, chapter 1, verse and 1. And here's the crazy part. That four-headed beast in Daniel 7, the leopard, is part of the seven heads in the Revelations. Greece, same beast. Same heads, same exact thing. I'm going to say it again. The leopard in Daniel 7 is the Greek empire. And that Greek empire is one of the red heads of the of beast in Revelations. It's the same people. You understand? Javani, the Javanites. Javan. Esau conquered Javan and called themselves Greeks of Macedonia. It's the same place. Do what you got. First Maccabees, one and one. And it happened. After that, Alexander, son of Philip, the Macedonian. The what? The Macedonian. The, Mac Philip the Macedonian, go ahead. Who came out of the land of Chedom, had smitten Darius, king of the Persians and Medes. So he was in Chedom, but he was a Macedonian. So these Edomites conquered this land. I'm going to give you a prime example. When you read a Jewish encyclopedia, I left something out. Um, I think it's um, ver, um, volume four or five. On page five, volume, volume four or five, whatever. Volume five. On page five, it, it mentions white Khazars and it mentions black Khazars. Now, some say the black Khazar represents them being of status low and the whites were high. But in the encyclopedia, it says they were dark as the Hindus. So that more than likely, more than likely, those Khazars that were dark were the original inhabitants of that area. And the white ones took over. For example, when you think of Australians, who do you think of? White people. Are the Australians really white people? No. They, they're, they're called the Aborigines of Australia. They took over. You think of so-called Jews. You think of Negroes? No. You think of the white folks over there. It's the same exact thing. They conquer people and they become the people and take over. Now, Get um, Esther 13, regarding Philip the Macedonian. Esther 13, verse 6. I'm just going to skim fast. Esther chapter 13 and verse 6. Right. Therefore have we commanded that all they that are signified in writing unto you by, by Amon, who is ordained over the affairs. So we're done with Amon. That's all I want. Get 12 and 6. 12 and 6. Let's see what he was. Chapter 12 and 6 in the Apocrypha. She went there first. Esther 12, verse 6. How be it, Haman, the son of Amadathus, the Agagite, who was in great honor with the king, sought to molest Mordecai and his people because of the two eunuchs of the king. Who was it? Who were the Agagites? What nation they came out of? Who knows? Who? Amalek. Amalek. When you read Genesis 36. 36, Agagite was a king named Agag. That king Saul didn't kill. He was a king of the Amalekites. 
So this guy was the descendant of that king who they didn't kill. Amadot, the son, says, um, Amen, the son of Amadot, this the Agagite or, he, or Edomite. He's also called, um, let's get 16 verse 10. Same book. That's why the Apocrypha was removed. 16 verse 10. For Amon, a Macedonian, the son of Amadatha, being indeed a stranger from the Persian blood. Stop. So now he's called a Macedonian. An Agagite to a Macedonian. So what are the Macedonians? What are, what, what, what are they? What, what are they? Really? Edom. Edom. So Edom overthrew the Greeks as well. Overthrew them as well. All right? You had... Um, there's a video the other day called uh, Esau, Rome, Herod, and Khazars. When you go to an hour and nine minutes, there's an article that's posted he has where they admit, finally, that they are Khazars. It's undeniable. You start from the hour and ninth minute to the 20th minute, the article, they, they confess, yeah, we're Jews, we're, I mean, we're Edomites, we're Khazars, yeah, big deal. Because we're still here in slavery, so they don't care whether you know or not. But now y'all know, out their own books. All right, now. Get me, I ain't got much time. Get me uh, real quick, AP, APFN.org, the link I sent you. Now, when you examine Herod, Herod Archelaus, Herod Archelaus was another Edomite that reigned over Judea. He reigned over two particular areas when he ruled under the Roman rulership. He gained rulership over Samaria, and he gained rulership over Judea. The two lands in possession, once again. Esau has an infatuation with our land. They always had an infatuation with it, and they always want to rule it, whether as the Romans, whether as the Greeks, or as so-called nominals, always. Go to um, historical perspective um, topic. There's only a few sentences, and I'm going to stop. Okay, stop there. Go to where it says, at the peak. I'll tell you when to stop. At the peak of their empire, it is believed that the Khazars had a permanent standing army that could have numbered as many as 100,000 and controlled or exacted tribute. Astonishingly, from 30 different nations and tribes inhabiting the vast ter territories between the Caucasus, the Aral Sea, the Ural Mountains, and the Ukrainian steeps. So they were fierce people. Jump down to Dispeculia. Go down. This peculiar, right there, this peculiar and obscure race. This peculiar and obscure race inhabiting that land were described as blue-eyed and of very fair complexion. Not Arab. Now you know what they look like. Blue-eyed and very fair, pale complexion. Go ahead. Commonly, they had long reddish hair and were reported as very large of stature and fierce of countenance. Like Russians look, or Irish. Go ahead. Other sources have added observations that there were Black Khazars and white Khazars. The ones that converted. Go ahead. Noting that the latter were light skinned and handsome, while the former were dark skinned. Those are the original Khazars. Go ahead. This has, however, been rather conclusively refuted by scholars who have established that the distinction was not racial but social. So they're arguing whether they were of dark complexion or dark or low status. So it's, it's, it's they're arguing back and forth. Go down to. Um, the Khazars' conquest and war. Next topic. Go down to where it says of, right there, of ferocity. Of the ferocity and warlike tendencies of the Khazars, there is little doubt and much historical evidence, all of it pointing to a race of people so violent in their dealings. Sound, sound, sound familiar? Violent in their dealings? Go ahead. With their fellow men. With their own people. That they were feared and abhorred above all peoples in that region of the world. Now go back to Malachi once again. Hated above all people. Go to... Mm, the Arab Chronicler, right next one. The next Arab one. Chronicler, Ibn Said al Maghrabi, writes They are to the north of the inhabited earth towards the seventh clime, having over their heads the constellation of the Plo. Their land is, co is cold and wet. Accordingly, their complexions are white, their eyes blue, their hair flowing and predominantly reddish, uh -huh. their bodies large, and their natures cold. Their general aspect is wild. Wild man. Next one. Ninth century. The ninth century monk Druthmer of Aquitaine, in his commentary on Matthew twenty four fourteen, in um, Exposito in Matthew Exposito Exposito 
in Matthew, Matthew evangelism. evangelism stated that the Gazari Gazari is, is Kazar. Go ahead. That the Gazari or Kazars. They were, the, the, the Amalek um, so called say Gazari, trying to sound, make it sound fancy. Go ahead. Dwelt, Dwelt where? Dwelt in the lands of Gog and Magog. Where the original Gog and Magog at? They conquered them out of there. Remember, they said they were fierce and ferocious people. They conquered them out the land. That's probably who the black Khazars were. Go to the territory. No, according to Benjamin H. Friedman. Go down. According right to there. Benjamin H. Friedman himself, a Jew, an apparent longtime associate and confidant of presidents and statesmen, in an address presented in 1961 so called Jew, you know, at the man. Willard Hotel in Washington, D.C., the Khazars were so belligerent and hostile that they were eventually run out of Asia and scattered amongst the nations of Eastern Europe. Uh -huh. Henrich von Neustadt, around 1300, wrote of them as the terrifying people of Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog, eat them again. That's not, no, Gog and Magog is Japheth, Genesis 10. But here we got Edomites called Gog and Magog. See, see what I'm saying? The Edomites called Macedonians. Edomites called Romans because they overthrew them. Go to um, the territory of the Bulgars. The territory of the Bulgars themselves, legendary for their fierceness in battle, was conquered by the Khazars. Each other, conquered just Bulgarians, same people. Go in ahead. AD 642, a portion of them fled westward to the region of the Danube in the Balkans and formed what is now modern-day Bulgaria. Uh -huh. Even in modern times, Muslim history calls the Khazar raids and the terror of those inhabiting that land. To this day, they call the Caspian Bar, Bar el Khazar. The Khazar Sea. They call the Caspian Sea the Khazar Sea. Because they were right there. That's their land right there. So real quick, almost done. Go to um, second, no, Obadiah, no, second Ezra 6. Second Ezra 6 now. So what I'm showing you is that each head on each dragon, Esau conquered the original inhabitants of Japheth. For example, when you examine the people known as the, the Minoans, Ionians, Etruscans, and Medes, they're dark. Those are the original inhabitants of Europe. That's Japheth. Minoans, Etruscans, and the Medes. The Medes were known as Northwest Iranians. The, 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 the Medes and Persians look very much alike, and they're very dark. And the Medes are Japheth. Magi in Genesis 10, M-A-D-A-I. You understand? They were dark, and they resembled the Persians. You had Semites and Japhites look similar. But Esau conquered those nations out of there and took over and pushed them further out towards the other islands, towards the Pacific Islands and all the areas. Pushed them further out. Like they're doing in Hawaii, they're gentrifying Hawaii. Um, they're doing it um, to uh, Australian Aborigines. They did, oh, he even got white Africans, Afrikaners. Same exact thing. No different. Read what you got, second out your six. So not yet. Second Ezra six and verse you know one. Second Ezra chapter six verse seven. Regarding Esau, why did okay. why did Jacob grab a hold of Esau's heel from the very beginning of class? Second Ezra six verse seven. Then answered I and said, What shall be the parting asunder of the times? Or when shall be the end of the first and the beginning of it that followeth? End of the first means the end of, the, of this rulership. What shall be the end of it? What's going to be? What's going to let us know the end of it? Go ahead. And he said unto me, from Abraham unto Isaac, when Jacob and Esau were, were born of him, Jacob's hand held first the heel of Esau. Jacob's hand held first the hand of Esau. Go ahead. For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. So Esau is the end of the world. That means he's the ruling nation on the, on the world in the last days. Revelations 12. I'm not going to go bypass that. Revelation 12, real quick. There's two more, and that's it. Revelation 12. I'm actually going to finish. <laughs> Revelation 12, uh, verse 3. Revelation chapter 12, verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Rome, and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Referring back to Rome or Herod, 
who tried to kill Christ in Matthew 2, verse 1 to 13. Go ahead. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations uh -huh. with a rod of iron. Uh -huh. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. That's Acts 1. Go ahead. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Africa, West Coast, go ahead. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. This is the end of Esau's world. This is this leading up to the, the, to the, to the beginning that followeth. Get 17, verse 3. It says back in verse 7, and there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. I mean, their armies fought each other. And scarlet color. And she was dressed in red because she was part of that beast. That's why she's dressed in red herself. And decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Uh -huh. And upon her forehead was a name written. See what her name is. Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. What does Edom call in Psalms 37? That's who this is. That's who it is. That's why it says Jacob is the beginning of it that followed. Esau is the end of the world. And we are the beginning that followed. And that dragon is defeated. That beast is defeated. That's a wrap. It's our time to rule. All right? So I'm going to end it on that. Well, Mark 4.22, and I'm going to end it on this. Mark 4.22, and that's it. So Esau can't hide these things. Whatever he tried to hide, it's a wrap. Can't hide those things no more. Shouldn't so let us read. Mm. Mark 4.22. Mark chapter 4, verse 22. For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested. Or no one hid, or nation hid that shall not be manifested. Go ahead. Neither was anything kept secret, but that it should come abroad. Go ahead. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. So listen, at the end of the day, if you want to believe that that um, the so-called white man is a Jew, it's a shame on you. But if you want to believe that the so-called that the uh, Esau is an Arabs, even more shame on you. That ain't biblical whatsoever. Stop trying to make these ambiguous nations of Arabs Esau. Stop. It's a so-called white man. That's who it is. Period. Gaga Magog is Russia. He's part of that red dragon. Greece is Macedonian. Greeks part of that dragon. Um, who, uh, who else? Gomer, France, part of that dragon. Germany, Ashkenazi, part of that dragon. America, part of that dragon. Russia, Russian Jews, same thing, part of that dragon. They're all the same damn thing. Britain, same people. France, same people. Part of that dragon. Whether they call themselves Swedish or Serbian, Polish, it's the same damn people. I'm Elder Nathaniel, Israel United in Christ. YouTube likes to shut our channels down, as some of you have noticed, <laughs> ever so often. Subscribing to join IUIC will assure you will always stay connected to our YouTube accounts. We want to do our best to make sure this truth gets out. Please click and join our subscriber YouTube channel called Join IUIC to stay linked to all of our videos. So again, please make sure you subscribe to this and join IUIC channel to get your latest updates on all our YouTube channels. Shalom.